Maybe a little bit higher. Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is time for another IC support group meeting. It is Sunday, May 23rd. And my purpose in doing these meetings, as I say every single time, is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you. I don't want anybody minimizing you. I don't want anybody telling you that this is all in your head. I don't want anybody telling you that you're damaged goods. I don't want anybody diminishing you. I want you to feel strong. I want you to feel confident. I want you to feel informed. And I want you to feel ready to kick some butt and get the care you need, right? So we are live streaming on YouTube and Facebook, although I have my cameras now really close. So now my eyes are going to be going like this instead of like this. Um, and let me just, I got to make sure Facebook is okay. Hello, Facebook. Hi, Tabitha. Alrighty, already, already, already. Here we go. <sighs> All right. So, so, so let me introduce myself. My name is Jill Osborne. Uh, uh, I'm the National IC Support Group Leader. I've been a support group leader for 28 years. Um, I bring to you three college degrees, a degree in chemistry. Yes, I'm a geek. A degree in pharmacology, drug chemistry. Yes, I'm an even greater geek. And a degree in psychology. Yes, because I like people and I didn't like working in the lab. And so... Um, I kind of walk in a very interesting dance. We do a lot of research on the IC network, but at the same time, we also obviously do patient support. Hello, Joan. It's nice to see you. What's going on with Facebook? Hmm, I don't get it. What's going on with Facebook here? And I've come to realize that this side, when I look this way, is my worst side. <laughs> so let's give it a let's give it a moment here. Hi, Laura. Hi, Nancy from Missouri. Hello, Linda. Hello, Carla. Oh, Carla. Okay. So, okay. So now that I know that Facebook is working and you know, the sun is really bright. And so I know that the lights aren't right and I probably look all washed out. Um, hi, Jeannie. Carla says, I'm so glad to see you. I saw the doctor and found out I have a stage one rectocele and cystocele. I will be starting pelvic floor therapy next week. Carla Hunt, that is really, really good. Listen, you've got to work on these muscles as quickly as possible. The challenge with um, the pelvic floor is that if it gets tremendously stretched out and you end up with a rectocele and a cystocele, if you let it get stretched out and you don't intervene early, Sometimes physical therapy and Kegel exercises won't work. <clears throat> and so you might actually have to have surgery if it were stage three or stage four. So girl, you're doing the right thing. You're catching this early power to you. Do it. You just have to do it. That's very, very important. Now, hold on a sec here. We've... All right. Hello, Sheila. Hello, Donna. Nice to see you too, my IC sister. You're all my IC brothers and sisters. But some you are. You are. Hello, Anne. Going to the urogynecologist this week says, uh, one says IC, one says overactive bladder. What questions should I bring? All right. So, Anne, the difference between interstitial cystitis and overactive bladder is really characterized by your sense of urgency. When you're waking up at night to pee, are you waking up because you need to reduce pain? Or are you waking up because you think you're going to leak? If you think you're going to leak, then that's overactive bladder. Overactive bladder is associated more with incontinence. Interstitial cystitis is, a company, is characterized by discomfort, pain. You're running to the restroom because it hurts and you feel better once you pee. Hi, Kim. Hi, Jeannie. Tabitha says, I'm having a renal ultrasound tomorrow and they want me to have 32 ounces of water and hold it for at least an hour, hour and a half. I'm scared to do it. Girl, girl. Yeah. You know, that, that, so, that tells you so much that the people that are arranging this test don't have a freaking clue what you're going through. I have gone through exactly the same thing. I remember, gosh, this was when I was in college. Uh, I had uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I had about 12 ovarian cysts at the time. And so they wanted me to do the same thing. 
they had me drink two big glasses of water and then I get there and they're running late and they go, well, can you hold it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and the lady goes, um, can you just pee out a little bit? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> so Tabitha, listen, number one, don't, you don't need to freak out. Let me tell you exactly what to do. At least this is what I do. Whenever I have to have a test like that, I drink a glass of water as I'm walking out the door. As I'm walking out the door. That's all I do. And I will tell you, they've never caught me. Um, never. Now, listen, I'm not a doctor. I'm not supposed to give medical advice. You know, I'm just telling you what I do. I know that if somebody asks me, because I have IC subtype 5 central sensitization, the nerves in my uh, in my bladder are more sensitive, even though I do have a healthy bladder. Um, uh, if I tried to drive somewhere with a full bladder, as soon as I got there, I would need to pee. And so I, what I have found when I've done those is literally five minutes before I get out, uh, before I'm going out to my car, it usually takes about 20, 25 minutes to get to where my hospital is or my doctor is. That's when I drink a big glass of water. And the odds are when you get there, you're going to have to sit for 15 minutes. And so that's 35 minutes later. So by that time, you've got fluid coming back into your bladder and they'll pro you'll probably be fine if you did it that way. But I'm just telling you what I do. You can try it the way they did it and see how you do. Um, or there you go. And listen, they can't stop you from peeing. If you got to pee, you got to pee. Hello, Carolyn. Hope you're well. I Oh, thank you. I, I, you know what? I'm better today than I was last week. You know, I was just two days out of a epidural. And what I didn't know about the epidural is it causes um, you to get very fleshy and a rapid heart rate. And so I was doing my meeting last week. In addition to my back just throbbing, my heart started racing because of the damn uh, um, steroid. And, and it was just like off and on, off and on all throughout that meeting. And so I just had to I had to take a break. Hello, Lisa. How's life in Houston? Hello, Anne. Anne going to the Uragano this week. One says OAB. Okay, yeah. There, so there, you get your question. Hello, Stephen Bambi from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So nice to see you. Hello, Philippa. Linda, urethral burning will not quit. All right. So, Linda, let's go over what we, the common causes of urethral burning. So, so um, number one, the most common trigger that we see for urethral woman for urethral burn, <laughs> urethral burning in a woman is estrogen atrophy. Your urethra is like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to aging. So you have to remember the bladder and the urethra are designed to hold toxic waste because urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea. So how can the bladder do that for hours at a time and not get damaged? And the answer is that both the bladder and the urethra and the vulva and the vagina have a very thick coating of mucus. And the purpose of this mucus is to serve as a protective barrier. And that's why you can hold irritating stuff in your urine. You can hold urine for reasonable periods of time, even, even if you didn't have IC. It's all because of this really nice thick coating of mucus that we call the mighty mucus. Unfortunately, that, that mucus is estrogen dependent in women. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, that means you have lots of mucus. That means you can get away with stuff. But as you get older, you have less estrogen. That means you have less mucus. That means that your urethra and your bladder's ability to defend itself is compromised. That's not a disease that's aging. And it's the urethra that is the, the canary in the coal mine. It's the thing that starts to hurt first. So ask yourself, is your vulva dry? Is your vagina dry? If it is, then so is your urethra and so is your bladder. So the very first thing we look for is estrogen atrophy. The second thing we want to consider is, is there any chance that you have infection? Because you can have an infection in your periurethral gland. Your periurethral gland is about halfway up your urethra. So your urethra is kind of like the size of your little finger. And about halfway up on the outside is the equivalent of a donut that kind of wraps around it. 
and it's actually the female periurethral gland. And this gland, just like the male prostate gland, can become infected. And when it becomes infected, it can cause some pain and discomfort. Um, the way you can tell if you have an infected periurethral gland is you just stick your finger up your vagina about an inch, obviously, with hands washed or wearing gloves, a little bit of KY. And if you stick your finger right in your vagina, right along the front side, if you feel what, what it, a little bump, it feels like a deep pimple. It's not big. It's going to be small, like the size of a pea at, at, at the biggest. If you feel a bump right there, we're going to be looking at potentially an infected periurethral gland. Now, the third thing that we're going to look at is chemical irritation. Again, if you're older or you're on birth control, you where your estrogen levels are limited, your skin is going to be more vulnerable. So are you using a fabric softener, which would leave a chemical smell in your underwear that also would leave a chemical which could really irritate your bladder quite badly um, or your urethra quite badly. Uh, are you wearing uh, pads? Are you wearing mini pads? That can be an issue because of the chemicals in that. Or, you know, laundry detergent. If I put on a pair of underwear wash and shear tied, I absolutely will have vulvar and urethral burning, usually within 30 minutes of actually putting that underwear on. So we want to look at chemical irritation. Now, over on our website, icnetwork.org, I have a blog. If you just search for urethra or urethral pain, it goes through all the other potential causes. But usually what we see is estrogen atrophy. That's the very first thing we want to look at. Uh, um, all right. Anne says she has no incontinence and no leaking. Okay. So Anne, if you're running to the restroom at night or during the day to relieve pain and discomfort, then that's the equivalent of interstitial cystitis slash injured bladder wall or injured pelvic floor muscles. You're going to be in one of those five subtypes. Uh, Janet says, my bladder pain went away after low back surgery. Awesome. Okay, now you guys, now listen. Now listen. Anne is the perfect person to be in this room right now. Because so many of us have been told for years it's a bladder disease. It's a bladder disease. And it's not now. We don't think of IC as an incurable bladder disease. We think of IC as a pelvic pain syndrome. Why? Because structures outside of the bladder can cause problems. And, and so we know muscles can cause problems. We know, uh, you know, if you've got tight pelvic floor muscles, injured pelvic floor muscles, trigger points, that can cause your symptoms. If you've got a bad hip, bad SI joint, that could be a trigger. We had a research study a year ago that showed that men with testicular pain uh, that 70% of them had an underlying hip abnormality. Okay. Um, and so it is true that for some of you, there could be a back issue. And Anne right here in face, uh, I mean, Jenna right here on Facebook says, my bladder pain went away after low back surgery. That's fantastic news. And it needs to open your eyes. Not everybody has a bladder disease. And that's the problem with Facebook right now is y'all are all sorts of different types of patients are in their own. You're, you're all together in one room or basically in the equivalent of one room in your support groups. And you're, and you're not the same. Some of your apples, oranges, bananas, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you have bladder wall issues. Some of you have viral infections. Some of you have fungal infections. Some of you have terrible pelvic floor problems. Some of you have tailbone injuries. Some of you have fibroid tumors pushing on your bladder. Some of you might have endometriosis. Some of you might have Tarlov cysts. We have a brand new book coming out. I'd hope to have, it's at the printer now. It's called IC101. It's not just a bladder disease. I'm really, really excited about it because it's all about opening your eyes. If you haven't improved on bladder therapies, if you've been on bladder therapies for years and you're just not getting better, and if you've got a, a normal bladder, your bladder looks pretty good and the doctor's going, I don't know, your bladder looks fine. That This book is for you because it will open your eyes into the many other things now we know can contribute to these symptoms. Tabitha says, let's see. Thank you so much. I feel better. Steve says, hi, Jill. It's Bambi from Oklahoma. Menopause is flaring me up. Yeah, girl. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Dr. Jennifer Gunter has a brand new book called The Menopause Manifesto, released this week. 
It's going to be freaking awesome. You know, awesome. Dr. Jennifer Gunter is also the author of the Vagina Bible. And the cool thing about her is that she's she really takes on kind of the interests that try to tell women that you're unclean and that you're dirty and that you need to use douching and all that sort of stuff. Um, she She's very aggressive in her pursuit of normalizing women's health and normalizing aging as we get older. And the fact that so many of us have no, we have no warning. Our moms didn't tell us. You know, guys, I got to be really honest here. My mom never talked to me about sex, ever. I ever, I, I knew nothing from my mother. It was my older sister that pulled me aside when I went away to college and said, hey, we got to have a little talk here. And so it's so interesting. It's just so interesting how the older generations were. It's not that they they refused to tell us. It's that they didn't know to tell us because they didn't know. And, and so learning about menopause and the things that happen as we get older, but also learning about what happens after you go on birth control. Or if you have to go on a chemi chemically induced men uh, menopause because of uh, endometriosis, Lupron, things happen. I mean, for those of you who have watched me for the four years now that I've been doing these live meetings and I've been doing videos and stuff for over 10 years now, this is not the face that I had two years ago. This is what happens when you lose estrogen, you get wrinkles. <laughs> and it's so weird. It's so weird because like, honestly, on the inside, I feel 25. I was playing one of my, you know, I, um, I play uh, computer games. I really do like computer games and specifically World of Warcraft. I can, I used to be a raid leader and a guild leader and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I was hanging out with my group uh, last night and, and someone said, one of them said, how old are you, Jill? And I went, well, I took the Facebook age test and it said I was 28 years old. So I'm sticking with that. And I went, how old do you think I am? And they go, God, you know what? You, I bet you're like 32. <laughs> no idea they're paying, they're playing with a, a lady who could be their mom or grandma. That's okay. You know what? It's not. It's it's about what's on the inside, right? It's about what's on the inside. Uh, hello, Danielle. Anne says, "Does overactive bladder cause flares too?" Yeah, hun. You know, overactive bladder basically means that the nerves in your bladder wall have been very, very irritated. So, what's going to irritate nerves? Caffeine, stress. So, yeah, can overactive bladder flare? Absolutely. And if you're drinking caffeine and, and or you have that cup of coffee every day, you know, why do people drink coffee every day? It's because it triggers a bowel movement, right? And it's nice to start the day before you go to work having that done. That's why a lot of people enjoy doing coffee in the morning. That's why I used to enjoy doing coffee in the morning. So ca caffeine has consequences. It stimulates nerves. It stimulates nerves. Hi, Andrea. Nice to see you. Hello, Mede from Copenhagen, Denmark. So nice to see you. So nice to see you. Hello, Linda. Linda says, I'm on estrogen 1.5 a day. Okay. If that's working for you, you guys understand that hormone replacement therapy is different from topical therapy. If you're doing oral estrogen, or it's oral estrogen that definitely comes with more risk, you definitely want to do um, you definitely want to talk to your doctor about the pros and cons of oral estrogen. I mean, I'm completely convinced that that's why I, I ended up with that early, early, early uterine cancer a couple of years ago. I'd been on oral estrogen for about six years. And I thought it was fine because we have no estrogen driven cancers in my family. My mom used it for 50, 40 years. I mean, she's 92. She just stopped like a year ago. And I thought it was perfectly safe using oral estrogen. And it turned out I wasn't that it ended up causing an issue for me that ended up leading to hysterectomy. And that was really awful. Topical estrogen, on the other hand, is remarkably safe. When you just put estrogen on the skin, it stays in the skin. It doesn't, it's not distributed systemically. So it's not going to create a much greater risk of cancer as compared to oral estrogen. Um, and if you just Google topical estrogen safety, you can look at your own research studies. But what the research studies continue to show is that 
the research is quite good. The research is quite good. Hello, let's see. Wait, okay, Ann says, starting on physical therapy on June 2nd. Go for it. So, Ann, so at your very first appointment, their purpose is to assess your body. Uh, so they're going to they're going to study your body. That's exactly what you need them to do. Uh, they're going to potentially have you walk up and down a hallway, see how you're walking. They're going to measure legs. Let's see if you've got one leg longer than the other. They're going to ask you in-depth questions about your symptoms. You need to describe everything you feel, everything. If you have a weird pain to the left, a weird, a weird pain to the right, please tell them everything. Tell them if it hurts when you sit down. Tell them if it hurts when you have sex. Because they're the detectives. They're the myofascial detectives, for lack of a better term. Um, they will then, towards the end, uh, do an internal examination. And the internal examination is the most important part of the examination because all they're going to do is touch muscles. They're just going to touch muscles. And if they can touch a muscle and trigger your pain, that is your hallelujah moment. That is a very, very exciting. And let me get my model and show this to you. All right, where is it? Here it is. All right. Okay, we're going to take the uterus out. Let's see, we'll take the bowel out. We're going to take the bladder out. Is that a little bladder? All right, here you go. So here is your pelvic cavity, right? I mean, your, your pelvic girdle. <laughs> What's the exact word? Okay, this is your pelvis. And you can see that the pelvis is the center of the human body. It carries the weight of your torso because it, carry, it has the largest bones in your body. It deflects the stresses of when you're walking because the muscles in your legs do end up merging up here. But underneath it all, you have pelvic floor muscles. These are skeletal muscles. These are muscles that are involved with movement and functioning. And you can also see here, the important thing to see here is how unprotected they are. This is why if you're sitting on a bicycle seat or if you fall on your tailbone, you're gonna suffer a direct injury to your muscles like this. But when you're having your pelvic floor exam, basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna use their finger and they're just gonna touch muscle groups. And they might gently go along the length of the muscle. And you can see, look at how far I have to go to touch these muscles all the way back here. The most effective examination is an internal examination, a finger in your body touching muscles. Now you also have three layers of muscles. So where, where your joints are, you have deep muscles, you've got mid-level muscles. And then if I put on the shallow muscles, which are your levator anti muscles, these are your shallow muscles, okay? So don't be afraid of pain, just tell them it hurts. But if they can trigger pain by touching muscles, girl, that's exactly what we want. That is your hallelujah moment. As soon as, as soon as that happens, you need to say, okay, what are you touching? Tell me what you're touching. And you want to get the name of the muscle group so that you can research that a little bit more. Like for me, it is my left piriformis muscle, which I can feel right now. I can actually feel it right now. There's a little, a little uh, pinging that's going on right now because my SI joint on my left side, and here's the SI joint. This is where the hip bone attaches to your sacrum. My SI joint is unstable. So my muscles are always tight right there trying to keep it together. Now, let me, we got to be real honest here. And that is that if you have muscles that have been screwed up for years, and a lot of you do, there are some of you who sex has never been comfortable that you dread going to an OBGYN because you know it's going to hurt. Um, working on those muscles at first is going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. You've, you've had muscles that have been locked down like this for a long, long time. And what happens is some patients um, 
because the the examination is uncomfortable, they don't want to come back. Or you go for the first time um, and it's uncomfortable and you flare. You might flare for a day afterwards if your muscles are super, super messed up. But you can't walk away from it. No pill is going to restore muscle health. What restores muscle health is you working with the muscle. And it takes time and it takes diligence. But most importantly, this is a two-way conversation between you and your physical therapist. So you have got to give your physical therapist a lot of feedback as they're doing stuff. You need to tell them that hurts. That doesn't hurt. That feels okay. That doesn't feel okay. Because they can't do their job if you don't tell them how you how it feels and, and what that sensation is. As an example, if they're working on the levator muscle, so if they're if they're working back here, this is your rectum. So if they're working in this area, you might feel a sensation, that sensation you feel when you need to have a bowel movement. You're not gonna have a bowel movement. Don't worry about that. That's not gonna happen. It just means that they're working on that muscle group. So I was working with um, a lady last week who uh, her muscles were just a wreck. She'd had, they'd always been messed up. They, they were, have never been normal. And, and that's what she did. She went once and she didn't go back. And she's like, I want to take a pill. And I went, a pill won't fix you. Muscle therapy will fix you. And we have the research that proves it. We have research that proves that pelvic floor physical therapy outperforms oral medications for IC and other bladder therapies for IC almost two to one. And we knew that in 2008 when the National Institutes of Health released their first multi-center physical therapy study. Pelvic floor physical therapy is stunningly successful. It's just weird. It's weird. These muscles cannot be accessed from outside of your body. They can only be accessed from inside of your body. And so there's a, a little bit of uh, discomfort. I mean, I, 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 not just physical discomfort, but kind of mental and emotional discomfort when you do it the first time, because you just don't know. This is unusual. But I've gone through three courses now of pelvic floor physical therapy, and I cannot begin to tell you how good it has been for me. It has been stunningly good for me. Um, so anyway, I can go a little bit more into that. But really, honestly, Anne, just walk in and bear it all. Like, what do you feel? What are your symptoms? And give them lots of feedback. And let's see if we can get them to study your pelvis to see if they can figure out what's going on. And then if, if something is uncomfortable, once you actually start the physical therapy, you need to say, hey, man, this is hurts. Back off a little bit. And a good physical therapist will back off a little bit. Now, I do want to say one other thing about this, though. Um, one of the things that I ask patients when I work with them is, where is your pain located? Is it to the left or to the right? Or is it centered? Is the pain centered in your body right above your pubic bone? Or is it to the left of center, or to the right of center? If it is to the left or to the right, that's not your bladder. It's probably a muscle or something else. And so we want to make sure that they study those locations. Whenever you have persistent pain in one location, that's, a, that's an important question that has to be asked is what's at that location? What at that location could be triggering that pain? Okay. Hi, Kay. Kay says she loves a heating and cooling pad. Uh, yeah, that we gave heating and cooling pads away two weeks ago. Hi, Chimera. How are you? All right. Tracy says, I am new with this diagnosis. Can your whole abdomen hurt with this? I feel bloated and have no appetite. <sighs> Can your entire abdomen hurt? Yes, it can if you have had intense bladder pain that started to affect some of the other nerves and it's basically creating neuroinflammation throughout your abdomen or the, below the waist, pretty much below the waist. So that's absolutely possible. And also to the icy belly is real, uh, where you wake up in the morning and you got a flat stomach and three hours later, you look six months pregnant. And that's, we've asked a number of doctors what that is. And it was Dr. Theo Harris, Theo Harides, who said he believed that it was inflammation from a flare because it comes and goes. So, um, 
Uh, Tracy, it begins first with understanding what variant of IC you have, because we're not all the same. We have subtypes now. So some patients have Hunter's lesions, which we call IC subtype one. Some patients have bladder wall irritation, genuine real bladder wall irritation. And in that group, we're gonna look at chemical irritation. We're gonna look at estrogen atrophy. We're gonna look for chronic infection of some type, especially chronic candida infection. A bigger group of patient symptoms began because they have a muscle problem. They fell, they have a tailbone injury. They had a bad pregnancy a delivery. Uh, they were torn during a delivery. They might have been an athlete. They have a history of athletics, a hi history of repetitive trauma. Okay. If you have pain that starts when you sit down, but is relieved by standing up, so your pain is very positional in nature and it changes as you move your body, we're really going to be looking potentially at something called pudendal neuralgia. What that means is that you have a nerve that is being compressed when you sit down that is relieved when you stand up. Uh, you, or if you have symptoms of PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder, where you feel this really painful, really awful, embarrassing arousal sensation, but it hurts. There's nothing good about this sensation. I know I had it for about a month, my first year, and then it went away because the nerves calmed down. And then I see subtype five is um, central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions. These are the patients who have IC, IBS, fulvodynia. And that really is more about a central nervous system disorder. And I can talk about that in a bit if it does come up again. So with, with chronic overlapping pain conditions, our goal is to calm the entire nervous system down. That's what we've got to do. Leanne said, just had my bladder blocked with a stone and my bladder was at its max capacity, was excruciating. You were at, you were at uh, the ER for seven hours with severe urethral spasms and then you passed the stone. Oh my God, girl. Oh, I'm so sorry. You were begging for a bathroom and they wouldn't give you one. Eh, girl. This is the new hug. This is the hug. And Leanne says she wants to try to speak with me. You're going to have a lithotripsy on Thursday. So much irritates me and the hormones are worse, which were, okay. A uh, girl, let's, let's just plan on talking. We can talk sometime this week. Tomorrow is my day off. Uh, to, I would say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are looking pretty good for me as long as I don't have elder issues. My, si my sister and my brother-in-law are here taking care of my parents. Yes. Leanne, we'll talk. Okay, hon. You know, um, our phone number is right on our website. It's 1-800-928-7496. Ask for extension two or extension three. I answer those extensions. So try on Tuesday or Wednesday in the afternoon. Okay. Pacific time. Shannon says, hello. Missed you the last couple of weeks. I've been in pain. You've been pain free for five months. Yeah, baby. That's what we like to hear. Hello, John from Wisconsin. Long time no see, dude. I hope you are doing well. Afton, can back issues impact the bladder and cause irritation and bladder spasms such as SI? Absolutely. Absolutely, Afton. Absolutely. Uh, it can happen a couple of different ways. I mean, number one, that you have to remember that your psoas muscles, which go up your spinal cord, they're big ropey muscles, actually are anchored in your pelvis. And so if you've got pelvic floor tension, the odds are that's going to create psoas muscle tension, which could cause low back pain. Um, but we also have to ex respect the fact that uh, nerves can also be involved as I'm going through with my two ruptured discs. So absolutely. Uh, Sam says, is painful bladder syndrome, so it's just the same as another name for interstitial cystitis. Great question. Let me give you guys a little a little nomenclature history for you, I, for the other history geeks out there. The first name for IC was Tick de la Rue of the Bladder, and that was established back in the 1800s. And then they had a couple of other names back then, really obscure Victorian names. 
Um, and then back in the 1920s, it was Dr. Guy Hunter who called it interstitial cystitis under the mistaken assumption that it was the interstitial layer of the bladder wall that was compromised. Turns out that's not true at all. Um, some doctors called this um, a urethral syndrome, frequency urgency syndrome, things like that. And then finally in 1987, the National Institutes of Health released their first diagnostic criteria for IC for research studies, and they called it for sure interstitial cystitis, okay? Let's see, I want, I want to say this the right way. Um, there was a time when all the international research community gathered together to talk about IC. But back in the 1990s, um, people got a little cocky. Specifically, kind of the Americans got a little cocky about the, their beliefs of IC. And some Americans started telling other doctors from other countries what to do. And the other doctors from the other, and basically, uh, I mean, I witnessed this. I was at meetings. I saw this happen. Uh, basically, you know, one doctor came in and said, you just need to do it the way we're doing it. We know everything, right? I mean, that was kind of the attitude of the Americans back in the 1990s. So what happened is the Europeans said, we don't want to do it your way. And they split. And they created something called the European Society for the Study of IC. So we had the Americans and we had the Europeans. And then the Asians mobilized beginning in Japan and, and they created their own groups. And so for a while, there was a lot of back and forth kind of conflict. One of the things that the Europeans said is, guys, listen, we got to fix this freaking name. Interstitial cystitis is not the right name. We need to call this a pain syndrome because that's what we call this for other parts of the body, that it is a pain syndrome. So it was the Europeans who started saying, hey, we're not just gonna call it IC, we're gonna call it painful bladder syndrome. And they specifically said IC slash PBS. And the Americans kind of pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled. There was lots of debates, but the Americans finally said, okay. And the Asians said, no, we wanna call it hypersensitive bladder syndrome. They haven't had a lot of traction with that, but they're actually, that's probably the correct name to be, believe it or not. So anyway, so we did IC painful bladder syndrome for about five years. And then the Europeans came back and said, no, we've got it wrong. It should be bladder pain syndrome. So then it became IC bladder pain syndrome. Now, if you were in Europe, you would only get a diagnosis of IC if you have Hunter's lesions. If you don't have Hunter's lesions in Europe, you're diagnosed with bladder pain syndrome. And in Asia, you're diagnosed with hypersensitive bladder uh, uh, syndrome, Hyper, hypersensitive bladder, was it syndrome? I think that's what it was, okay. In the United States, we um, decided kind of collectively that we could not do that because so much is at stake over the word IC. I mean, we got the social security disability ruling over IC and there's been so much um, good education focused around the word IC that the con concern was if we stopped using that, the people could lose their disability. The people that a lot of the progress we've made, we would lose. So in the United States, it is IC slash BPS, IC slash bladder pain syndrome. Although we are coming closer and closer to just saying, okay, it's only IC if you have Hunter's lesions, everybody else has bladder pain syndrome. Ironically though, just to make this just a little bit more complex, in research circles, this is called urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome, UCPPS. And, you know, I think it's important not to be invested in any name. It's all about your symptoms. Generally, what I say to patients is if you're going and you're going to a doctor and you're getting a second opinion, don't walk in and say you have IC. It's a terrible idea. You need to walk in prepared to discuss your symptoms. 
Your job is to get them to focus on your symptoms and study your body. And if you just blurt out, hey, I've got IC, you're going to fall down what I call the IC rabbit hole of those doctors who were trained in medical school 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that this was a mental and emotional condition, which it certainly is not. You know, the, our own government has spent over $100 million on this now, and it's absolutely not a mental and emotional condition. This is a real chronic pelvic pain condition. So lots of names. Don't be invested in any name. And at some point in time, the, in, the name interstitial cystitis network is going to have to change. I just don't know what to change it to yet. Hello, Marianne from Gothenburg, Sweden. It's so nice to see you. Hello, Kim. Oh, I do have some good news here. Um, so, Sistro ProTech update. Sistro ProTech update. We had 150 bottles last week that went out. This week, we're going to get 216 bottles um, with new labels. So, so the ownership for Sisto Protec has changed. My land will no longer own it. It is now owned by Augenot.com. And, um, and so uh, what happened is the big production run that had to be done, those 8,000 bottles, all have to go back to the factory to be relabeled with a new label. Same formula. Nothing's changed. It's just a white and yellow label instead of a turquoise label. So you're not going to be seeing... You're not going to be seeing this label anymore for Sister Protect. It's going away. We have 18 bottles left. And they'll be gone this week. So anyway, I will have 216 bottles. Uh, I'll put them back in inventory on Tuesday. And then our big shipment is probably going to be in another two to three weeks. So we will probably sell out of Sister Protect again in a day. We sold, uh, we sold out in two hours. We will sell out again. So if you want Sister Protect, um, you know, you can place an advance order. Uh, you can call us uh, tomorrow and just place an advance order or just stay tuned. I plan on putting, as soon as the tracking shows it's in California, I'm putting it back in inventory. Okay. All righty. Shannon says, Shannon's doing Iolaril in, injection uh, installations weekly for three years now, and it's a good one. Iolaril is a combination of chondroitin and hyaluronate. It's available in Europe. It's not available in the United States. It has a coating effect. Patty says, is there something wrong with having a neurostimulator? Patty, no, there's nothing wrong with having a neurostimulator, but it's it's a, it's a major procedure here. So when we think about when we think about treatment, the very first thing we have to understand is your body, right? So um, uh, we have to understand potentially what your subtype is, because if your symptoms are being driven by estrogen atrophy, then we want to make sure we're treating the estrogen atrophy. And when you treat the estrogen atrophy, some of your symptoms might improve, and you might not need something like a neuro neuromodulation device. If your symptoms are the result of tight pelvic floor muscles, and we want to make sure you're doing the correct therapy for that, which is going to be pelvic floor physical therapy. There is a place for neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is particularly, particularly successful with incontinence. It can absolutely change somebody's life. Anybody who has uh, uh, urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence. Um, and uh, some have been using it with pudendal neuralgia just to try to calm the nerve down. Um, but it comes with serious risks. That's why it's a step four treatment option. The American Urology Association treatment protocol has six steps of treatment. One, two, three, four, five, six. They don't want you to do the hard stuff until you do the easy stuff. It's arranged with respect to the risk of adverse event. So we want to make sure you're doing the good stuff. We want to make sure that you're following the diet, that you're drinking plenty of water, that, you're, that you've tried supplements. The AUA says try some supplements. They don't come with the side effects that the other therapies have. If you have done all the step one therapies and we go to step two, which is going to be physical therapy, it's going to be oral medication or, or bladder installations. Step three is going to be uh, treating hunter's lesions. If there are any in there, potentially hydrodistension. Neuromodulation is in step four. There are two, step, two types of neuromodulation. There's 
uh, ankle stimulation uh, called post-tibial nerve stimulation, also known as um, uh, urgent PC versus uh, um, uh, pudendal uh, neuromodulation or sacral, no, is it? No, pudendal neuromodulation, sacral neuromodulation. And there's something new. And it just, the, that name is just right there. That inner stem type of device requires surgery. They have to do surgery to implant the leads. There's a trial period for a couple of weeks. And if you pass the trial, then they implant a stimulator down by your hip or in your upper butt buttock. The challenge with neuromodulation, especially inner stem, is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of adverse event reports reported to the FDA over Interstim. And you can go there. It's, if, you, if you search for the MOD, M-A-U-D-E, MOD database, and you put Interstim in, and you just go back five years, you can read real time the problems that people had with neuromodulation. The most common problem is um, deep tissue MRSA infections. The challenge of operating in that area of the body by the sacrum and on the bottom is that there is a lot of uh, bacteria down there. And one of the um, complaints that was filed was from a doctor who just believed that um, trying to do this type of procedure in that area was absolutely prone to uh, introducing bacteria into the tissue. I've worked with many patients who have had MRSA infections after interstim. Um, devices can move. Devices can break. Leads can break. If you, one of the patients that I worked with, every time she had a bowel movement, she got shocked by her, by her stimulator. And her doctor told her that was normal. And she called me crying and it said, is that normal? And I went, no, that's not normal. And we got her on the phone with Medtronic's patient assistance line. And they confirmed to her, absolutely not. You should not be getting shocked from a neuromodulation device. The biggest, I think right now, my biggest concern, because the, the device has improved, the leads have improved, the surgeons have gotten better. Um, the biggest problem that I see now is insurance coverage. If somebody is proposing doing interstim on you, you need to darn well get in writing that it is covered by your insurance. And we had a nurse uh, in Appalachia a couple of years ago who called and she called me and uh, her story was stunning. There were three urologists in her town. They all told her she had to have it. She fit, kind of felt forced into it. So they kind of like said, we're not going to care for you if you don't do interstem. So, so she made the decision to do it. She asked the doctor's billing office, is this covered by my insurance? They said, yes. She asked uh, um, the hospital billing office, is this covered by my insurance? They said, yes, no written pre-authorization is required. Then she called her health insurance directly and asked them, is this covered by my insurance? And they said, yes, no written pre-authorization is required. Week after surgery, she had a bill for $60,000, $70,000. Guess what? It wasn't covered. And they were threatened to garnish her wages. And she said, hey, I would never have done this if you hadn't told me it was covered. So the mistake that she made is she didn't get it in writing. You need to get it in writing. Understand too that Interstem requires constant monitoring. It's not like you do it and go away. You have to have it constantly monitored. And if it changes, if you have any weird, unusual sensations, you need to be able to get back into that doctor and have them check it out and make sure everything's okay. All right. Leanne says, my pelvic floor is shattered. Well, muscles, muscles, don't, I must feel like it shattered. Muscles don't shatter. Muscle, uh, I mean, muscles can break. Bones shatter. But it sounds like your muscles are toast. But, you know, you know, I, I, I've said this often. You know, I have a, I, when I was getting my pharmacology degree, I had a one-year surgical internship. It's a really rare degree. And if there's one thing that surgical internship taught me is the amazing, the amazing responsiveness of muscles. 
we could make a little tiny incision and just through muscle and we could just massage it. You know, we just massage it like this with forceps. And we could stretch that incision to this long and it would bounce back. When you work with muscles correctly, muscles are remarkably responsive. So Leanne said, I asked my urologist for a diagnosis for insurance purposes. He said painful bladder syndrome. I don't think he will say interstitial cystitis unless he has a cystoscope, unless you have a, cystos a cystoscopy under general anesthetic. Well, so technically, Leanne, he's following the European guidelines. I mean, you know, that's kind of what they would do. They would diagnose you with bladder pain syndrome unless they found Hunter's lesions. The other thing you could do, hon, is you could ask for something called narrow band imaging and narrow band Im imaging cystoscope. Uh, it allows them to look closely at your bladder wall without needing to hide or distend your bladder. And that too will also identify Hunter's lesions. Hi, Kathy. I'm 22 minutes behind on my questions here. Uh, Kara says, what kind of doctor will do pelvic floor physical therapy? A doctor does not do it. A physical therapist does it. You need a physical therapist that specializes in pelvic floor work. They have to have special training to do it. Billy says, mine feels like constant menstrual cramps. That's what it feels like. I mean, that's the way my pelvic floor, that's what my pelvic floor feels like when it's weird. I also get a pulling sensation, uh, like something's trying to be pulled out of my body or a pushing, either a downward cessation or an upward cessation. Hello, Amanda. Barbara says, bless you for answering phones. I'm going to try Desert Harvest Alice starting tomorrow. Yeah, give it a shot. Give it a shot. You know, um, I just remember that, that what the research studies are really pointing to for people with, say, estrogen atrophy, is that it is chondroitin, the ingredient chondroitin that helps to restore the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. And so I tend to recommend the chondroitin-based supplements before I, tend, before I go for the aloe-based uh, um, supplements. And that's just based upon research. Uh, do you recommend chiropractor? No. No. A physiatrist. A physiatrist is a doctor who specializes in muscles and bones. A physiatrist. Chiropractors, guys, can be really, really aggressive. I've got a very, very close friend who uh, got a broken back from a drop table from a chiropractor last year. You got to be really careful. You know, at this point in time, you've got some sort of pelvic floor injury or pelvic injury, for lack of a better term, and we don't know where it is. And until we understand the scope of that injury, whether it be a broken tailbone or, or whatever, um, being really aggressive is not necessarily the right way to go. I mean, you, we want to understand the problem before somebody starts hitting on you hard like chiropractors can do. That's my opinion. Jen says, just got a referral to a uro urologist, gynecologist for urinary challenges, not being able to fully empty urine urgency and leakage. This is all new to me. Girl, you have found the right place. And number one, no shame, no blame. You haven't done anything wrong. This is often what happens for some of us as we get older. Uh, so if you uh, uh, are postmenopausal or perimenopausal or you're in a chemical menopause, really, we're going to be looking at the consequences of the loss of estrogen on the urinary tract. You know, uh, what happens when you lose estrogen is that nice thick coating in your bladder wall that normally protects it gets smaller. It gets it diminishes it to a bit, uh, but also muscles can get weaker. And so if you're kind of going through that, um, I call it milking your bladder where you're sitting there, you know, and you're peeing and you're like, OK, am I done? Nope. A little bit more. Am I done? Nope. A little bit more. OK, I'm done. Stand up. Sit back down, couple more drops, then you're done. 
And, and that is very common um, be, uh, as we get older because the loss of estrogen kind of weakens our muscles to a little bit. I had a long talk with my doctor about that because I started doing that in my 40s. I don't do that as much now. And I, I mean, isn't that interesting? I mean, I do have to say, I have moments when I do that, usually at night before I go to bed. I don't do that during the day. I will do that at night before I go to bed. Rhonda says, thank you for su suggesting Peora. I've been taking it for over a week and my pain hasn't been as bad. I'm hoping it keeps improving. Yeah, baby, good. Peora, also known as palmito ethanolamide, was uh, brought to uh, the American uh, Urology Association annual meeting in 2019. PEA was remarkably effective at reducing pain in IC patients. That by month three, 87% of patients using it had a significant reduction in their pain. By month six, 20, about 25% of patients were pain-free and the rest were reporting shorter flares, fewer flares, less painful flares. And so what she's talking about is PEA, which is right here. Now people ask me what I take. Now, this is what I take because my bladder is normal. If you look at my bladder, it is a baby bladder. It is rosy pink and a happy bladder uh, because my symptoms, aside from some estrogen atrophy, are really not being driven by my bladder wall. My symptoms are being driven by my nervous system because I'm IC subtype five central sensitization along with a little bit of pelvic floor in there. And you know, bladder therapies never worked for me. They didn't. They did not. It, it was the muscle therapy that worked for me. And that's the whole point of our new book, IC 101. Kim says, do I recommend Eucora for IC? I think I know what Eucora is. Isn't that that powdered uh, uh, powder for, yeah, no, we do not recommend that. Absolutely not. Uh, Eucora is is one of the products that can be used if you uh, get recurring infections. Um, but yeah, that's not going to help protect your bladder wall. No, 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 no. Dawn says, I pee every 15 minutes after, and I eat well. I, do, I drink only water. I suspect my chronic cystitis is back. I'm losing my mind. I can shock. I can shop without peeing multiple times. Any thoughts? I have no pain, no pelvic floor, just frequency urgency constantly. So Don, uh, what's the quality and health of your skin? Are you dry? Is your vulva dry? Is your vagina dry? This could just be some estrogen atrophy that's drying your skin and making it more vulnerable. Uh, or it could be nerve irritation, nerve, you know, Constant chronic frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. We always do want to take a moment, take a step back, and let's make sure we're not accidentally irritating the bladder wall. So I was working with an older woman this last week who, oh, for a year, her symptoms were really bad. And she was just in dire straits and was crying every day and couldn't do the things that she needed to do. And and the therapies they were giving her weren't working at all. And so and she didn't know about diet. And so we were kind of going through it. And, and I said, well, what do you drink in the morning? She goes, orange juice. <laughs> she, she was like 70 years old, right? She didn't understand estrogen atrophy. She knew nothing about that. So I kind of went through the whole thing. So what she was drinking in the morning was two big glasses of fresh orange juice and a cup of coffee. And she was up all night. She'd been up all night every night for a year. And when I finally explained, okay, now listen, your skin can't protect itself because of your age and you're dry and your doctor told you you're dry, right? And she said, yeah. And did your doctor give you estrogen? She said, yeah. I said, did you use the estrogen? She said, no. I said, why? And she said, it burned. And I said, well, that's what happens. When your skin is super dry and you put something on it, it's going to be irritating. No doubt about that. But as you continue to treat that skin with estrogen, it continues to build mucus. You're going to have to work through that first two-week discomfort to try to get enough estrogen in that skin to start producing some really good protection. So she, you know, 
she went from thinking that she was dying of this weird disease to going, oh, wait. Okay, yeah, they told me I was dry. I, I didn't get it. And, and then she just didn't understand the consequences of the loss of estrogen on her bladder. It's like, no, you, honey, you can't, you can't do orange juice in the morning. You can't. And you can't drink coffee in the morning. She goes, but I love it. And I went, I don't care. I don't care. You're hurt. You have an injury. If you have a wound on your hand, would you pour orange juice on it and coffee on it in the morning? She goes, no. And I said, that's what you have to think of your bladder like. Your bladder right now is injured. You have to protect it. Mary Jo says, I'm having a hard time with pelvic floor sciatica. It's depressing. I've done well for years. It's frustrating. Not sure what to do. See, well, hon, um, uh, listen, this last year has been awful. The stress is real. We have all been under tremendous stress from COVID. And when you're under stress, your body tightens muscles. And one of the very first muscle groups that gets tight is your pelvic floor. And so, and, and the fact that you've got sciatica proves it. That means you have got tight piriformis muscles. And so it, it's, we've just, I mean, we're all there. We're all, um, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who works for a major hospital and they're among their staff, they, they see the stress. I mean, we're all there. We are all operating under exhaustion. And they're calling it languishing, that we're almost languishing in, in um, times we could never have imagined two years ago. And so I think, number one, you know, we got to work on the stress management. We all do. We all do. We have to do a lot of relaxations. We got to get back into our body. We got to find that sense of peace and calm that's been so elusive for so long. And then it's about getting right back into pelvic floor physical therapy, hun. And you've got to learn to do your work at home so that when you start recognizing those first symptoms that you have a glass wand and you can get in there and do the work that needs to be done, right? Kim says, what do you recommend for constipation? I've been using Eucora and estrogen cream. Um, so, um, so with uh, constipation and IBS also in particular, this is all about improving your fiber. We need you to eat 20 to 25 grams of fiber a day with plenty of water. That is the best and most effective way at making sure that you are having normal bowel movements. Uh, so you got to look at the fiber you're eating, look at the bread you're eating, all, the, all that, and count it up and see where you are. And if you're not close to 20, you got to eat peas every day, eat beans every other day. Like, I mean, that's where Taco Bell burritos are awesome. You just don't get the onions on it. Don't get the, don't get the uh, red sauce on it, just beans. A burrito a day? Yeah, baby, that does well. Um, but... I hope I didn't just flash you guys my underwear. I apologize if I did. Okay. Or my cellulite. Okay. You know. All right. Heather's tummy fiber is acacia fiber. It's a soluble fiber. Very gentle, but also very effective. And so this is the other thing that I use is I put it into whatever it is I'm drinking. You know, teaspoon a day does a job or regular girl. Regular girl is also, but it combines a prebiotic with a probiotic. So either one of these, you could get in the IC network shop. Love them both. I apologize if I flashed you guys. All right. Jen says, the azo medicine helps me with pain, but I don't know if it's safe for long term. It's not meant to be used long term. Azo is not... You had a full hysterectomy a year ago, but I had it before then and it stopped, but it came back. 
Well, yeah, honey, you're, it's important, you know, that you remember when you think about your pelvis, right? Your pelvis carries the weight of your torso, generally through your hip bones. But if you are very, very large, you're going to put, be putting a lot more pressure on your pelvic floor. And so, I mean, that's just reality. You guys, now please know that if you've got personal questions or you just don't know where to go next, you can call me and I'd be happy to talk to you. I'm on the phone every day except for Mon except for most Mondays with patients. I'd be happy to talk to you. Courtney said, just had a caudal injection nerve block supposedly to help with pain. I'm in more pain now. You know, there's a there's a bit of a recovery after a nerve block, especially if they if they have used um, steroids. I'm doing the same thing. I had mine a week ago, and and they warn you that that it gets, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. So carry hope in your heart. Jen says, "How did they diagnose Hunter's lesions? They find them. They look at them, usually with a um, uh, through a hydro distension with cystoscopy or narrowband imaging." Jen says, is there a link to the supplements? Just go to our website, IC Network, icnetwork.org and click on the shop. Is there one that we recommend for chondroitin? Chondroitin, bladder builder, I think is the best supplement on the market today because it combines PEA with chondroitin and some other stuff, but it's also a very rigorous, uh, aggressive formula. And so if you're sensitive, we probably wouldn't want you to do that one. So there's bladder rest. Sister Protect, Sister Mend, or Sister Renew. Hi, Lori. Sharima says, almost two years ago, I had the inner stem removed with the leads and the plastic sleeves breaking off and still remain inside of me. I can never have an MRI again. I still feel pain where the battery pack was inserted. I've not seen a urogano since the surgery. I do need help finding a new doctor as I'm having major flare-ups every day. Um, sure. So you guys, I do have, uh, we do have a database on our website, but I also have another database that was given to me by doctors at Harvard of pelvic pain doctors uh, in across the country. And so um, you're welcome to uh, um, tell me where you are and I, I can look at that list for you if you want. Um, we usually do that towards the end of the meeting. Is there a certain brand of chondroitin that I recommend? No, with chondroitin, especially if you're in Europe or you're in England and we can't ship to you for one reason or another. If you're going to go to a store, look for a chondroitin glucosamine product, but the chondroitin should be from chicken. It should not be from shark fin and it should not be from cow trachea. With cow trachea, there is a risk of mad cow disease. Europe has banned chondroitin from cow trachea. And in fact, it's shipped to the United States because we're such suckers here. Um, and so, and we don't want to support the shark fin industry because it's decimating shark populations. It, no, nothing crueler than cutting the fins off of a shark and throwing them back in the water and they can't swim. Oh man, you know, you want to talk disgusting. I have no patience for the whaling industry or that industry. For God's sake, people, we have finite resources in this country. Mary Jo says, if you do bladder builder, you don't need the Piora. You're right. Bladder Builder combines everything. Christy says, thank you for talking about chondroitin instead of primarin cream. I was told to use est estrogen twice a week, but I'm a bit concerned. Honey, um, cream, topical estrogen cream is considered remarkably safe. Google it. It's Google safe estrogen cream safety. And you look at the research. But the research studies that I have seen come out in the last couple of years continue to show that it's remarkably safe. And so I'm not worried about the topical estrogen. Uh, you're, you're talking apples and oranges here. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, can we heal the bladder? And the answer is there's nothing that will heal the bladder that's artificial. But if you give the bladder what it needs to produce mucus, then you are, in essence, giving your, you're giving your bladder the opportunity to kind of repair itself. And so topical estrogen is remarkably effective and successful. Chondroitin 
is still synthetic. Well, no, I mean, it's not synthetic. I mean, it's a man-made supplement that comes from a natural source. Um, but but it will it only sits on the surface. It will never repair your bladder. The only thing that can repair your bladder is your bladder. Your job is to create an environment that will support healing. And that's hard. That's hard to do. It means you can't pour acid. So if you're IC subtype one, hundreds lesions, IC subtype two, bladder wall driven, then the last thing we want to do is pour acid on the wound every day. If you pour acid on the wound every day, the wound will never heal. Diet modification is critical for IC, IC subtype one and IC subtype two. And that chondroitin can maybe give a little bit of extra coating, a little bit of extra protection. Mary Jo here on YouTube says, estrogen cream is really good, but she can't use it because you had a blood clot and your doctor doesn't want you to take it, right? I mean, we're all different. We all have different issues. And it's a you talking with your doctor about what your viable options are. Like Christy here on Facebook says, I was told not to use HRT by my primary care provider. And Jen says, you can't take HRT because of a rare ovarian cancer. Okay. So if, if that's the case, if you have, if they can't, if you can't, cannot use an estrogen product, your doctor doesn't want you to do that. Then your next level is going to be to do something that has a coating effect. And that's going to be the chondroitin, something with chondroitin in it or hyaluronate in it. I use topical estrogen myself. Kim says, is magnesium safe for constipation? Global healing oxy powder? I have no idea. I mean, if you have constant chronic constipation, say from using opiate medica medications, there's another medication they can give you that can help. Um, but Miralax, I mean, that's a discussion you have to have with your doctor. Carol says, my nutritionist ordered some urine tests from Genova Diagnostics. I'm not sure what exactly it will show, if anything. But are there urine tests I should make to, to check for embedded or bacterial infections? Next generation DNA urine test is, is really that next level. If you're curious, if you could have an overgrowth of fungus or candida. Um, in, in, did you see, did you all see, by the way, did you see in the paper two days ago in India, they are now having an outbreak of, of a black fungus in COVID patients, including COVID patients who are recovering, they're getting a fungus growing throughout their body because they're so immune compromised. You know, when you think chronic infection, you a lot of us think bacteria, you have to open your mind uh, to the concept of fungal infections. And it was our own National Institutes of Health who discovered five years ago that a lot of IC patients who were flaring were flaring because they had an overgrowth of candida in their urine. And that's where the next generation test shines because that will tell us if you have fungal infection. Um, and it can tell us also if you got an obscure bacterial infection. The challenge with next generation tests is it's hard to interpret the results. I mean, technically there should not be any fungus. If it comes out that you've got candida, then slam dunk, you have candida. The, the bacterial side of it's a little bit harder to interpret. Uh, it's tricky, it's very, very tricky. Uh, Jen says, I do kegels every day and night and they don't help. Well, Jen, um, okay, so I, I can't necessarily scroll back. You do not do kegels if you have tight muscles. Kegels will only make tight muscles worse. You do relaxation exercises when you uh, have pelvic hypertonic muscles, hypertonic pelvic muscles. So if you're, if you're doing uh, kegels because you're incontinent and you're trying to prevent uh, prolapse from getting worse, then that makes sense. Otherwise, kegels are a mistake. And if kegels hurt, that's also, that also tells you that we've got something else going on with your muscles that we need to know. Uh, Jeannie says, my oncologist told me it was okay to use uh, topical estrogen because it's different than taking the pill. It doesn't go into your bloodstream. Exactly. Exactly. Billy says, do we need to take estrogen? 
It depends upon the quality and health of your skin, hon. If your skin is dry, if your skin is dry, uh, then estrogen will help your skin produce more mucus. Your mucus membranes are estrogen dependent. So what are your mucus membranes? Your mouth, your bladder, your urethra, your vulva, and your vagina. And as many an older woman can attest, things dry out as we get older. Why? Because your body uses estrogen to produce that mucus. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus and you can get away with drinking Dr. Pepper every day. When you're in your 40s or God forbid you've, you're on Lupron or you've had a hysterectomy, you don't have a lot of estrogen anymore. Your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That is not a disease. That is aging. And when you give that skin a little bit of estrogen, it immediately starts producing mucus. It immediately plumps up. And again, if you Google it, topical estrogen safety, you can see the pictures. Uh, so Christy says, what's the best thing to use instead of estrogen cream? You could use coconut oil, use a really good cold pressed organic coconut oil, or you could do the magic. Let's see if I have it right here. Here it is. So V Magic, v, v Magic is a combination of a couple of different oils. There's um, olive oil, there's sea buckthorn oil, there's avocado oil in it, honey. Um, and so V Magic is probably the closest in consistency to mucus. I mean, uh, a lot of patients absolutely love this stuff. You can get it in the IC Network store. So, and, and the night, see, it's not sticky at all. There's no stickiness to it. It's really close to being uh, almost natural mucus right here, right? So if you've got a dry uh, vulva, this would be something that you could try. And see, look, I can just rub it right off, right on my skin and there's nothing bad in it at all. What does it smell like? It kind of smells a little bit like olive oil. So quite a few of you are talking about Eucora, these new, this fairly new powdered drink that is supposed to help prevent infections. Um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that. Um, uh, so we suggest prevent instead, Allura or prevent, but man, it's whatever works for you. I, I, you know, let me just look at, I think it was one of the ingredients in the Eucora I thought was potentially risky. Let me look. I didn't remember, was it citric acid? Let me look at the ingredients here real quick. I don't want to give you bad, bad information or wrong information. Yeah, it's citric acid, guys, and B6 and vitamin C, although the vitamin C is non-acidic. So that's the challenge. That, that's why we didn't kind of jump on the Eucora bandwagon because of the citric acid. Uh, Jen said... Uh, Uh, I love coffee though. Okay. Cara said, I use Eucora to try and prevent infections. It has different probiotics that are supposed to balance. So now I'm confused, honey, look at, look at prevent or look at this one. Hold on. Prevent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So this is uh, made by the same company that makes Bladder Builder. Um, and uh, I just saw their first TV commercial. It's amazing. We're going to have commercials for all of the, the bladder supplements. It's such a good company. Sarah, flaring for the past few weeks. Girl, why do you think you're flaring? Mede says, I've tried using Vagifem and now E-string. Is that okay? Sure. It's not cream. Yeah. No, no, no. It would. I mean, the, the E-string is like, um, is like a, a round, um, 
a really thick rubber band, only it's not rubber and it's coated with estrogen and you put it up your, up your vagina and um, it will stay there and it will release time release estrogen, but it can fall out. And so you have to wash it off and put it back in. I had an E string once. I, it just was a little bit awkward for me. I didn't quite like it so much. All right. So guys, when we do these meetings, there are usually three steps to it. We, we start with Facebook and YouTube. Then we head on over to Zoom so that you can ask me one-on-one -on -one questions if you want. If you don't want to, that's fine with me. Um, and then we come back and close it out on Facebook and YouTube with any last questions. We've been going now for um, 90 minutes. So um, let me go ahead and get the Zoom meeting started because we didn't do it last week because I was not feeling well. So hold on a sec. So the way you go to Zoom is if you go to the main IC Network website, so just go to icnetwork.org, icnetwork.org. Click on support right under the logo. Click on streamed support group meetings. And you will see the link to, to Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. And I'm clicking on Zoom right now. And I am launching that meeting. Give it a minute. Recording in progress. What? No, I didn't ask for it to be recorded. Well, anyway, even if it is recorded, I don't, we don't use it. Nobody, and guys, if you come into Zoom, know that nobody can see you except the other people that come into the Zoom meeting. People, um, and, and it's not recorded in any way that we share it with anybody, okay? The Zoom portion of the meeting, other than audio. So don't worry about people seeing your face if you don't want them to see your face and you don't have to show your face if you don't want to. All right. So let me go ahead and um, get the invitation. All right. So YouTube. There is your invitation. Facebook. I have to do it a little bit differently on Facebook. Different computer, my friends. So again, I'm just going to icnetwork.org. And I'm going to the support pull down menu, streamed support group meetings. All right, and I'm just copying the link. And let's go ahead and just paste that into Facebook. All right, Facebook, there you go. I will let you in one at a time if you want to come in. So everybody, it's time for a potty break. This is if you, if you go get a drink of water, go use the restroom. If you want to come into Zoom, great. If you don't want to come into Zoom, that's fine too. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. I'll be right back. How's everything going, Dad? Okay. I don't know. Are they still here? Did they leave? Where's mom? How you doing, mom? You doing okay? 
Did you have a good breakfast with uh, Jan? Okay, I'm still doing my meeting. We just took a little break, so. Alrighty then. Alrighty then, alrighty then. Rhonda says, V Magic works awesome for me. No more burning vulva. Love it, girl. Love it. I'm glad that it's helping you. Hello, Jan. All right, guys. So we're so anybody who wants to come into Zoom, I posted the link on Facebook. Let me give it to you again. Oops. All right. All right, Jen. Well, look at that. Looks like you got me. What can I do for you, hon? How are you feeling today? Let's, if you can unmute your microphone. Um, hey. Hey, girl. How are you? I'm doing good. Just um, relaxing. Um, I just, I found you guys. This is amazing. I think I have a lot of stuff to learn, so. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I know, and you said here that you love coffee. You got to lose the coffee right now. What are your symptoms? Tell us what your symptoms are. Yeah, I mean, you exactly describe uh, my potty time. Like sit on the toilet, <laughs> wait, and then oh, the, okay, there it kind of like kind of move around, lift up your belly a little. Yep. Right? And, and then you think you're done, and you wait some more, and you, okay, so some more comes out, and then you get up. You cough walking into the other room and it's running down your leg. Like you never can oh. fully empty. Okay. Well, that does, I, so, so I, I can usually empty the fact that you're not emptying completely like that. Uh, definitely. What does your doctor say? What's your doctor saying about what's going on with you? He said, that's not normal. That doesn't sound normal. I'm going to give you a referral to your OGYN. Okay. That was just Friday. So. Okay. Okay. And so he's right. And I will say that for me, um, that's only happened to me once in my entire life. And that was after a, a dog attacked and I fell down and I basically this all came out. So uh, it's not quite what you're describing, but the fact that that you're dribbling, even after you think you're done, tells us that, that there's something else going on. And so sometimes what it can be is a, um, a prolapse uh, where your muscles are just kind of worn out and they're stretched out and um, uh, it's collecting in one area and perhaps not. During. Have you, have you ever noticed that if you push in a certain spot, you get more fluid out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a prolapse. So, so I mean, so you've got to see, let's see what the, uh, your gynecologist has to say. Have you had, okay. have you had any children? I did just one. Okay. And when did you have that baby? Uh, she's 32 in October. Okay. So <laughs> a long time ago, when did, yeah. when did this start for you? This started about, two years before I had my hysterectomy and I kept telling the doctor something was wrong. And then, you know, then they found the cyst and then the doctor's like, Oh, well, we'll just wait see to three to four months and see if it'll go away. So I got like a fourth doctor finally who would listen to me. And, uh, we did the hysterectomy and it turned out to be a uh, granulosa cell tumor cancer. So I okay. literally had to fight for, the prolongment of my life. I hear you. I so started about two years before that, which is part of, I think maybe the the cyst was pushing on the bladder in some way. Okay. How big was I don't it? Know. How big was the cyst? Uh, 12, 10 to twelve centimeters when they removed it, and it burst upon a removal. Holy crap! That's big. It was eight centimeters when the incorrect doctor said, let's wait three or four months and see if it goes away. Eight centimeters? And he said yes. to wait? Oh, my God. He did not I mean, know what he was doing at all. I mean, so like one, two, three, four, five. That's like four inches. Or yeah. So. 
Yeah, a little bit more than four inches. Woo! Okay, now what did they I do? Through the ringer. <laughs> okay, so so you were struggling with incontinence two years before. Did they were they thinking that the incontinence was related to the cyst? No. Um I saw Euro GYN, they tested it, they had me empty, they said there wasn't much in there, and just to do kegels. So they obviously kind of probably missed something. Does the, um, when do you know you're going to leak? Uh, you know, I don't always know. Okay. But, you know, if I feel urgency, then I know I might obviously leak. Okay. Okay. Um, does leaking change based upon your body position? Do you, do you leak when you're laying on your back or when you sit down suddenly? Is there any? I, th I think maybe it changes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there, are you having pain too, or is it just the leaking? Uh, not too much pain. No, I have some on my um, lower left side, but I think that's just like back problems, you know? Lower left side, in, are we talking internally or externally on your skin? Internally, like right above where my hip is. Okay. Okay. That's important. Like barely above, you know, where that bone starts. So if you put your hand right, right where your hip bone is, right? So here, so here's my hip bone. I'm not going to flash anybody. Don't worry. Okay. So like, look, here's my belly button. Here's my hip bone. If you yeah. put your fingers right on the inside of your hip bone and push in and then release, is it painful? Uh, let's see. Just right on the inside of your hip bone. Okay. No, but sometimes it does get painful without doing anything to it. It's not painful right now. Okay, but I good. Did just go to the bathroom recently. Okay, so but I don't know because that's a muscle attachment point, right? So um, when we look at the inside of your hip bones, again, here we go. Yeah. Um. Um. How's your skin? What's your skin like? It's pretty good. It's starting to get dry sometimes. Okay. Okay. And and I don't want to bring this up if you don't want me to bring this up, but you did mention something else that you thought might be contributing to oh, it. I'm 170 pounds okay. at the height of 5'2". So that's a little heavy. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. I do. I do think that it would, it would only help you in the long run to try to lose some weight. I do, yeah. you know, and, and again, you can totally see that on this model. You can totally see how, you know, the weight of your torso is collected here, but it's definitely going to put strain inside your pelvic cavity too. So I think that would be a good, a, a good, thing. Well, listen, when you go to the doctor, when you go see the doctor, don't walk in and say you've got IC because number one, incontinence is not a symptom of IC. Okay. So we, okay. we, the, the only context where we would see incontinence in the IC patient population would be somebody with IC subtype three pelvic floor driven, where you've got an issue with your muscles and your muscles are just, uh, flaccid and and you just dribble out that's that's kind of the context that we would see this in so okay. instead i want you to walk in and really and i and i and just really succinct four years ago this began four years ago when i started experiencing abc okay the doctors at the t the doctors at the time kept thinking it was related to my uterus we eventually did do a hysterectomy. They eventually did. Find, they did find a cyst. We removed the cyst. Everybody was hoping and praying the incontinence would go away. But I'm sorry to say that it hasn't. And I'm here to try to figure out what we can do to improve this. And this is where neuromodulation actually might be a, bit, a little bit more helpful. If this is a genuine nerve issue as compared to a muscle issue, we've got lots and lots of options here. Uh, also, in the meantime, you've got to protect your bladder right now, regardless of what's going on. 
Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got, at, at your age, you have dryness. You do have estrogen atrophy. It is very, very important that you not drink coffee. Okay. Okay. Coffee is neurostimulatory. All, you're just poking and prodding those nerves, you know, uh, with a cattle prod, for lack of a better term. That's what caffeine <laughs> does. And so don't do, and even decaf, don't do it. Let's, we've got to create an environment that will support as much healing as possible in your bladder. And the same is true with orange juice. Let's just stay away from the strong acids for a while and let them do a proper evaluation and see what they see. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. All right, hon. Well, listen, I hope you'll check back, you know, I uh, will be. when's I'm your, when's your appointment? Educated. Yeah. When's your I appointment? Have to admit, I still have to make it. I just um, saw my doctor on um, Friday. So okay. I'll probably call on Monday. Well, don't be afraid of it. You know, the, don't be afraid of it. Um, again, there's no shame, no blame in what you've got. We all get injured. We all end up dealing with estrogen issues for, for, for us women. And, and so it's probably going to be a, a, a combination of things. But the, I guess mm -hmm. the other thing that I would want to know is, going back four years ago, did you have any traumas? Were you in a car accident? Did you have a fall? Do you remember anything at all? No. No, I think that's probably when the cancer decided to start growing and pushing. Okay. That's my only, you know, guess. It's just a guess. I don't know. Did you go through chemotherapy? No. Um, I was stage at 1C. Okay. And um, chemotherapy is not necessarily indicated for this type of cancer. Okay. And so we're just monitoring with blood tests. All right. And a CT scan if necessary. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, good. I hope you'll come back and let us know what they find. Okay. I, I will. Thank you so much for all your attention. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Listen, we had two people come in and then they left. And sometimes we don't know why they've left. So I'm just going to leave Zoom open a little bit, but I'm going to come back and we'll just see if they come back. And let's just come back to uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook. All righty then, let's see here. Rhonda says, V magic works for me. No more burn burning vulva. Yeah, I love success stories. Like seriously, I love success stories. Okay, so again, guys, V magic for dryness or coconut oil. Candace says, please check out Issa Herrera's work in Facebook. She has a great book called uh, Girl, Candace. I show it at almost every meeting. <laughs> Here you go. Let's. Uh... Oh, goodness. Me. Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. okay. Let's go. Let's just kind of, let me just show you the ones that I think are the best because I mean, like, seriously, my friends, seriously, 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 do not force your doctor to guess. You have got to walk in knowledgeable and informed and understand what your body, you know, the different parts of your body, where they're located, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for those of you who have pelvic floor dysfunction, the early books that we have, as Candace just said, Ending Female Pelvic Pain by Issa Herrera, or she has the same book, but it's Ending Male Pelvic Pain. That is also a fabulous book for men. And then another book that Issa has is Ending Pain in Pregnancy. So this is awesome. Um, Amy Stein has her book, Heal Pelvic Pain. This is written for men and women. But my favorite book by far actually is this book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. And the thing is, is that this is actually free on Kindle Unlimited. Dr. Whoops, Dr. Weiss is a pelvic pain expert here in uh, San Francisco. 80 miles south of where I am right now. Urologist who saw back in the 80s that the bladder therapies were not working for the vast majority of IC patients. They simply were not working. 
And so he started looking beyond the bladder. And he was really the first mainstream doctor to really dive into muscle. So he became a master at pelvic anatomy. And one of the things that he really started focusing on are what can we do to rehabilitate tight muscles and eliminate trigger points. Um, and so he became just a preeminent specialist in this. But well, this book tells a story of um, his journey in a way, because one of the things that really intrigued him is why did patients, why do patients keep having very, very, very tight pain? Uh, muscle, I mean, tight muscles. And that's when you take a step back and you have to look at bones. So if you walked in this clinic, into his clinic 20 years ago and you had a trigger point and tight muscles, he would massage those muscles and you would have walked out as close to normal as possible. But what baffled him was why was it back a week later? Why was that exact same trigger point back a week later or those muscles tight again? And again, that's when we have to look at bony structures because it's bones that influence muscles, obviously, along with stress. And, and so uh, that's when we want to look at the hips. That's why we had that research study last year, which found that 70% of the men with testicular pain had an underlying hip abnormality which is very, very interesting. Um, so he's the one who started looking at hips, SI joints, knees. But the mind-blowing part of this book is really about the feet, that it turns out that the great majority of his patients who had long-term chronic muscle tension had it because they were not walking normally. They had Morton's toe, Morton's neuroma, shin splints, uh, a variety of... of of uh, feet issues. And, and because your the feet, the, the stress of your feet is, is reflected directly up into your pelvic floor. If you limp, that's going to affect uh, your, your hips. If you have one leg longer to than another, that's going to affect your hips, which is going to affect your pelvic floor. So this book, in, in all honesty, is, in my opinion, the groundbreaking book. And it's free on Kindle Unlimited. So come on, no excuses. It's freaking free. Um, you can buy print copies from us in our store for $29 on Amazon, the 36. As you can see, it's a big, meaty book. Um, what's particularly encouraging in this book are all the patient stories that, that he shares. I mean, the patient stories are just wonderful. So look, I just opened it up to... Um, Let's see. Okay, th this is the chapter on bones. Okay, a 56-year-old man was rear-ended while driving his car. Upon impact, his right foot was on the brake pedal. He experienced immediate right low back pain and pelvic pain when the impact transferred the force through his right leg up towards his pelvis. Pain developed in his right buttock, groin, and leg. The patient also felt pain with urination, erection, and orgasm. The mechanism of this injury is one of a shearing motion to the pelvis that travels up the leg to the ischium, one of the three hip bone components, and the sacrotuberous ligament via the hamstring muscle. The ligament connects the sacrum to the sit bone and the hamstring muscles attach to the, lig the ligament, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Our examination revealed dysfunctional pelvic floor muscles and elevated right hip and trigger points along the low back muscles and iliac crest. All right. The patient's symptoms were alleviated with pelvic floor physical therapy, osteopathic manipulation of the displaced hip, uh, and trigger point injections of the involved muscles, and prolotherapy for the ligament that was messed up. And that's what I'm waiting for is prolotherapy for my bad ligament. Here's another one. 37-year-old woman had a sudden unexplained onset of pain in her buttock and leg that radiated down to her heel. She began having pubic and vaginal pain, urinary burning, ur um, and rectal spasms. These symptoms suggested lumbar disc herniation, urinary infection, hemorrhoids, and colitis, but all of these problems were ruled out with lab tests and an MRI of her back. Dr. Weiss's internal physical examination revealed pelvic floor dysfunction. My external examination disclosed a short leg, SI joint instability, sacroiliac ligament laxity, and a tender sacrotuberous ligament. An x-ray of the patient's pelvis confirmed a short leg with a significant tilt at the base of the sacrum. A simple shoe lift and SI manipulation combined with internal myofascial release to relax the tight pelvic floor muscles relieved all of her bladder symptoms. 
Joanne on, on YouTube says, yes, I have Dr. Weiss's book and learned so much. I went back to my chiropractor who got me to lift some of my shoes and I've been working on my hips to sacrum. Yes. Here's another one. A 46-year-old fireman developed penile, perineal, and anal pain after lifting, lifting a heavy fire hose. Dr. Weiss's examination and nerve testing revealed a pudendal nerve injury for which he administered nerve blocks and internal myofascial release for three years. During this time, the patient had varying periods of relief, but unless he limited his activity, he experienced a painful flare. Concerned about the limited progress and wondering if a biomechanical problem would explain it, Dr. Weiss referred him to me. I found SI joint instability and performed a series of prolotherapy injections to tighten the SI ligaments. This solved the problem. The patient had durable relief from his pudendal nerve pain and was able to discontinue his pain meds and finally return to work. So, you know, we're really focusing on mechanics now. Is the pelvis functioning mechanically correctly? Uh, it's so important. Um, let me see if I can find. So look at this for, look at this for a moment. This is one of his pictures. And the, in this, he's demonstrating what happens to your pelvis when you have an ankle that rolls. So here's a normal pelvis, right? So we have the muscles going straight up and you can see that the hip is in proper position. Now look at what happens when you roll your ankle to the inward. Look at the angle. And you can see that number one, the hips are no longer level. And number two, it's it's now stretching too far, um, this muscle right here and the ligaments right here. And so literally, if you have had a long-term foot dysfunction, this could explain why you have pelvic pain. We have, I have one, one of our, our clients uh, was born with a club foot, a club foot. And, and her foot and her pelvic floor muscles are so tight. And the challenge for her is they can't normalize how she walks to get her muscles to relax. It's, it's, you know, it's challenging. So here we go. A 50 year old man had been seeing me occasionally for over 10 years for intermittent perineal pain. Now your perineum is that space between your rectum and your vagina or your rectum and your testicles. Okay. So a 50-year-old man had been seeing me occasionally for over a 10-year period for intermittent pain. I'd been treating his tight pelvic floor muscles and trigger points with internal manual therapy. Though he received great relief from these treatments, pain flares inevitably occurred. Frankly, I've never completely understood the mechanics of his symptom flares until he came in one day complaining of hip pain while walking over hiking trails. This led me to question him further and ultimately put us on the right track. I asked, if there were, I asked if there were any other musculoskeletal problems that he had not thought to mention previously. He responded that he had always had pain at the base of his large toes that he attributed to arthritis. But because he knew other family members had the same problem, he never sought attention for this congenital issue. I then examined his feet, something I've not been accustomed to doing, and found bunions and moderate overpronation. At that moment, the light went on. I had found the origin for his hip pain that he had experienced during hiking and also of his intermediate peri intermittent perineal pain. Podiat podiatric treatment eliminated his pain flares. Uh, bunions are a sign of abnormal pronation, which lessens the shock absorbing action of the feet, placing added stress on the leg and hip. This additional stress affects the hip rotator muscles, the obturator and piriformis. The dysfunction of these muscles can create a wide range of pelvic floor complaints, including perineal pain. You know, when I was young, I was uh, pigeon toed a little bit. And they had, I wore special shoes like for a year. Uh, Judy on YouTube, uh, on Facebook said, what is urethral syndrome? Urethral syndrome is when you have just urethra symptoms. It just means that your urethra is being triggered by something. Some doctors will diagnose urethral syndrome. Some won't. Um, uh, in literature under men, the, a urethral uh, syndrome is associated with chemical irritations, sometimes from soaps, uh, bubble baths, 
or spermicides. So when we think about urethral syndrome, we, 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 we think about what could be causing long-term chronic irritation of the urethra. And so it could be chemical irritation, but it could be dryness, estrogen atrophy too. And again, if you go over to our website, I have a blog um, uh, called The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. So go on over to icnetwork.org and read that, read that blog. Karen asks, how many are still on Elmeron? Uh, not a lot. Um, most, uh, I'm going to say that 98% of the patients that I work with now are, are off of Elmeron. The only ones that are on it are the ones that nothing else is working for them. And even then, we're still looking for options for them. Lori says, do you have a pelvic specialist doctor in West San Fernando Valley or see me back? Oh, oh, oh wait. Um, yeah, I'll, I will look at our database in a minute. Okay, so again, guys, when it comes to people with musculoskeletal issues, fabulous book. Cannot recommend it more. This is absolutely amazing. Um, if you're struggling with all, just a lot of chronic pain and you just don't quite know what to do next, when It Hurts Down Here by Dr. Angie Storr is a, a wonderful, very simplified book that will, will give you some very, very good things that you can do to help reduce pain. Um, and she talks, one of the things in this book that I really like, I mean, I think everybody should read this book. And you can see, I mean, I've highlighted areas. I absorb these books. Um she talks, she talks about the vagus nerve, which is interesting. You know, like, like I have been told that I have vagal, vagal nerve sensitivity and I have always my entire life had issues with sometimes when I have a bowel movement, I get nauseous and they say that that's all vagus nerve. I mean, it, it goes away after about five minutes, but it's my body. Um, I wanted to find this picture in here. It's a really cool picture in it. Yeah, here it is. So look at this. You see this picture right here? This is a sideways view of the nerves in your pelvis. And so you can see that all of the nerves eventually merge up at the spinal cord. And in fact, researchers have put radioactive tracers in the nerves from the bladder and then different radioactive tracers in the nerves for the bowel because they wanted to see if they ever merged, and they do. They merge at the spinal cord, and they end up in the same nerve, the same nerve bundle. And so this helps us understand something called neurocrosstalk. And when we certainly know that when the bladder gets really, really irritated, other things down there tend to get more irritated too, like the bowel. And when the bowel gets irritated, the bladder can get irritated and you got to throw in the vulva in there too, because you can see all the nerves end up merging. We call that neuro crosstalk. I used to say to my, my back when my IC was really bad, I would have, uh, I had a very specific sequence of events that happened. Um, I would have a vulvar pain one day, like vulvodynia, then I would have urethral pain for one day and then it would hit my bladder and I would have bladder pain. And it was just really, it was very predictable the first year. Uh, and that, it, that eventually went away. But I asked my doctors, what the hell was that? And they were like, we don't know. Well, now we know it's neural crosstalk. Now, listen, the, if you simply do not know what the hell is wrong with you and your doctor keeps saying your bladder's normal. And if bladder therapies are not working for you, this book just came out and oh my God, did we need this 20 years ago? This was uh, produced by Dr. Elise Day and um, Dr. Theodore Stern, who uh, are at Harvard uh, and Mass, Mass General Hospital. Um, and so what they did in this book is they went through every other possible condition which can trigger pelvic pain and IC symptoms. And so they invited experts from the best experts in the nation to contribute chapters 
so that you have a better grasp of what other things can be causing your pain. Like the lady here earlier who had back surgery and her bladder pain went away. There's a chapter in here on the spine and, and other bony structure abnormalities. Um, so um, the chapters are great. And I was thrilled to be asked to contribute to this book. I'm now published by Harvard. On the IC Network, it was ranked number one by Harvard several years ago. It's a top IC website. So I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to be proud of that. Pretty good. huh? Um, so in this book, um, what gynecological conditions can lead to pelvic pain? That's chapter three, chapter four, what male urologic problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter five, what urogenital problems can lead to pelvic pain in any gender? Uh, things like underactive bladder, overactive bladder, ureters, um, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, chapter six, what gastrointestinal problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter seven, what musculoskeletal problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter eight, what ligament and bone problems? Chapter nine, what neurological problems? Number chapter 10, what rheumatological, not neuroinflammatory, vascular blood vessel problems? Okay, and as academic as that sounds, this book is really easy to read. Okay, so here's the kicker and lots of great diagrams, lots and lots and lots of great diagrams so that you can see this. Again, it's free on Kindle Unlimited. No excuses. It's free. What do you have to lose? If you don't know what the hell's wrong with you, read this book. Go through everything. Do you have scoliosis? Do you have a bad foot? Do you have a, a, a vascular problem? Is there something else going on? This book is freaking amazing. And it's free. Come on. I want you to find the answer to your pelvic pain. Yet you have to remember that just because you have frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, that doesn't mean you have a bladder infection or it's your bladder. It can be something else. It can be your muscles. It can be bones. It can be all sorts of things. It could be a cyst pushing on your bladder. It could be a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder. It could be something pushing on a nerve, right? And then this, this book here, The Vagina Bible, and now the new book, uh, The Menopause Manifesto, uh, this, any women in your family, especially from girls, you know, teenager on up, give them this book. It's so good. And it's just a, it's just a real down to earth discussion of how do we care for ourselves? Like chapter 11, soaps, cleansers, and wipes. What can we do and what can we not do? Vulvar cleanliness 101. Main reasons women report that they wash their vulvas is for odor prevention. It's an import, it is important to remember that the concept of female cleansliness has largely been driven by a male-dominated society that for centuries, if not longer, has decided that normal female genitals are dirty. Another driving force is a multi-million dollar a year feminine cleaning product industry. Don't kid yourself. They are not here for your health. They are here to make women feel their normal anatomy is dirty and that feminine freshness is the feeling of confidence, comfort, and cleanliness. And yes, that is from an advertisement for a popular product. Many of the ads for these products are barely updated versions of the Lysol douche ads from the 30s. Oh my God. Lysol douche? Holy crap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's obviously a bad idea. I smell vulvas and vaginas all day long. That is actually part of my job as some vaginal conditions are associated with odor. Healthy vulvas don't smell any more than any other body part. I see women who have not showered the day they see me or have come right from the gym and there is no odor. And she said, anyway, and she said, some women are aware of groin order from their uh, sweat glands, these specialized sweat glands in the groin and around the rectum. This is the genital tract equivalent of armpit odor. <laughs> these sweat glands are located deep in hair follicles and secrete sebum, a thick oily substance that becomes part of the acid mantle. All right. And that's obviously what you wash is you watch, wash the hairy areas. So that's what she says. To start with where not to wash. the. Okay, I don't need to get into the intimacy there. Okay, but this is good. Water versus soap versus cleansers. 
Vulvar cleansing has never been studied. This is interesting considering the array of products that claim to be gynecologic tested or approved. What I advise has largely been extrapolated from studies that look at the best way to clean the diaper area, premature and term babies. Obviously, it's not a direct comparison, but the labia minora have thinner skin than the rest of the body. Uh, okay. There are two types of products to consider, soap and cleanser. Soap strips away the acid mantle, the natural oils and bacteria that are an important part of the skin's defense. If a product is called soap, I don't care how gentle it is, it can dry the skin, which can leave you feeling irritated and possibly more susceptible to microtrauma. The other issue with soap is it undergoes a chemical reaction when mixed with water that increases the skin pH to 10 or 11. Remember, the pH of vulvar skin is acidic around 5.3 to 5.6. Cleansers are not soap. They are synthetic surfactants and other chemicals designed to strip away dirt and leave the acid mantle intact. In general, cleansers are better for your skin than soap. I see cleansers. Uh, I use cleansers only except on my hands. Uh, I Yeah, there you go. Do you need a special feminine wash? No. <laughs> the Vagina Bible. Again, fabulous book. I mean, if you just don't know what to do about down there. Get the vagina Bible. It's great. So we've, you know, we got really good information now. We've come so far. All right, I'm gonna close the Zoom meeting. Sometimes we got 15 in there and sometimes we got one. I'm good either way. Zoom meeting is over. Candace says, working with a physical therapist who did sports therapy, spinal adjustments, and pelvic acupuncture, acupressure points has helped me tremendously. Exactly. Lori says, I wish I'd found Dr. Weiss. I know. And the, the thing is, I could have gone to him, but I'm in Kaiser, and Kaiser uh, wouldn't make a referral. I would have loved to have had him study my pelvis and my SI joint. Rhonda says, congrats, Jill. Yes, be very proud. You certainly deserve it. I've been following you for a long time. Thank you, hon. Thank you. So I want to do something. Um, so hold on a sec. So, you know, we've got this brand new book, IC 101. Next week, you're going to see the full cover back there. Um, it is the third edition of a book called Patient to Patient, Managing IC and Related Conditions by Gay and Andrew Sandler. Um, uh, I have stepped in as the publisher and we have updated it massively to include all of the subtyping information. Lots and lots of things are updated in it. And so um, um, now that we know so much more about the central nervous system, for those of us who have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, um, and how important it is to um, uh, reduce anxiety because when you're, when you're anxious, your, your brain will intensify that pain. When you're laughing, your brain will minimize that pain. And so in addition to working to protect our bladder and, and calm our muscles and get our muscles in good health, we also have to do things that will calm our, our brain and our central nervous system. And so we added, let me open up my draft here. I mean, my final draft, hold on a sec. Let me open it up on this computer. I wanted to do one of the, um, the guided relaxations in here. Hold on, let me find it. Oh God, I hope I didn't flash it. I hope I didn't just flash you my underwear again. All right, hold on a sec. Let me find it.
think it's on this page. It's 150 pages. It's a big book. And it's going to be spiral bound. So you'll be able to open it up and, and do the exercises on the, on the page. Let me see if I can find this. Here it is. All right. So guys, I want to do, um, let's just, I mean, like, I don't know about you, but my goal today is I, I just kind of wanted to have a happy, relaxed meeting today. And that, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Uh, Joanne says, what are the good OTC probiotic for IBS? Um, actually, we just put a brand new probiotic in our store on It's called Biome Defense Probiotics. And Joanne, if you, yeah, um, there was also a research study with a really strong probiotic um, that showed tremendous success for IBS. Um, I just don't remember what it was. I know that they got it through Costco. Um, if you call me this week, I can we can try to find that and dig that out for you. Okay, all right. So um, let let's just let's just do something that's a little bit calming and soothing. Okay, so we're going to do something called focusing. Oops. Hold on here. Got two computers working at the same time. So let's just go ahead and, and uh, let's close our eyes and we're going to take a couple of breaths. We're just going to take a step back from COVID for a couple of days. So let's just close your eyes and let's go in and out. And let's do it again. In and out. One more time, in and out. I want you to picture a place like at a beach or a park or a beautiful, comfortable place in nature that feels safe for you. It feels completely safe for you. Wherever it is, it's a place where you will be able to use a restroom, if you need to use your restroom, you will be in total control. So in your brain, I want you to just visualize a place where you feel safe and comfortable. And for me, I'll, it's gonna be sitting on a beach with the sun shining on my face and I can I can hear water, either waves or a stream trickling. And yeah, you know what? There's a bathroom if I need it, but I don't need it right now. So I'm just, I'm just going to sit here and just enjoy the heat and the sun and the healing power of nature. So it's a warm day. So it, the temperature feels good. It's, I, it smells sweet and healthy, that sense of walking on fresh grass. I can hear the wind in the trees behind me. There's lots of nature. And if you're lucky and you've sat here long enough, you might even see across the lake a deer coming down to the water with a fawn, which happened to me once. This is very peaceful. This is your place. Nobody can take this from you. This is your safe place. Let all of your stress go. You don't have to go anywhere. Nobody expects you to do anything right now. This is your happy place. Now, do you have something that's been bugging you? 
whatever it is, whether it is somebody who's been annoying you or whatever, pick your biggest problem. Don't think about it. Just pick it out. Now take this problem and move it as far away from you as you can. Like it's going on the rock 50 feet away. I'm just going to stack all my little annoying problems over on that rock right now. Is there anything else? Is there anything else that's bothering you at this moment? If there is, take a breath. And place it visually far away. Picture yourself now standing up, turning and walking away. You're going to leave the rock. You're going to leave the problems behind you. And as you turn and walk away, let the beauty and safety of this special place fill you with comfort and confidence and peace and strength and rest because I sometimes think that we just don't rest enough I don't rest enough then when you're ready open your eyes take a nice slow deep breath Focus a little bit, stretch a little bit, shake it out a little bit. And let's see if you calmed your brain a little bit, that we've calmed the sympathetic nervous system. We've stepped away from the fight or flight. We've stepped away from the stress. You know, I don't like that technique as much as I like the pink bubble technique. So I had a member of my support group, um, Linda, who is no longer with us, unfortunately. She did eventually lose her life, uh, not to IC, it was something else. But um, uh, she went to the emergency room with IC pain, and they told her it was her appendix. And it wasn't. Um, but she went into a coma during surgery. And... Um, uh, and she lived for many years afterwards. This is a happy story, guys. This is not a sad story. This is a totally happy story. Okay, so let me just set that straight. This was years ago. And I always promise members of my support group, you're in the hospital, tell me and I will come visit you. And, and I did that all the time. I, Andrea, thank you. I could have done better. But anyway, that was my first time trying to do that one. Um, uh, so I went and sat in the ICU with her. They let me into the ICU. She was in a coma. She was on a breathing machine. And I held her hand and I gave her the pink bubble technique. So with the pink bubble technique, what you do is you pretend that you're holding or a, a pink balloon rather. Uh, pretend that you're holding a balloon. Okay. And it's a, it's a balloon that's floating. It's not falling. It's got, he, it's got helium in it. So I was holding her hand and I was just talking to her and I kept saying, okay, Linda, I want you to take any pain you feel, anything, and I want you to pull it up your legs, away from your bladder, up, your, up to your shoulder, down your arm, and I want you to put it right up the string into the balloon. Let's fill that balloon with as much pain and stress and anger. Fill it up. Whatever pain you're feeling, wherever, wherever it is, whether it's on your foot or your bladder or your head, allow that pain. Visualize that pain traveling up through your body or down through your body to your shoulder, down your arm, to your fingers, moving up that string and making that balloon bigger and ever, anything that's bothering you, do it.
whether it is an annoying person in your life or a job difficulty or whatever, or any medical condition, man, you fill that up as big as you can. Okay. And when you're done, open your hand and let it float away. Just let it flow away and watch your eyes flood. The wind has picked it up. It's carrying it away. It's a nice release. So I literally did that with her every day for two weeks. <laughs> and then she woke up. She woke up. And I went and saw her. And she looks at me and she goes, what the hell? What's a balloon? <laughs> she was delighted. She said, that balloon was great. It really helped me. But it sure was strange. <laughs> and that shows you that even when somebody is in a coma, they can hear you. Hey, they can hear you. She heard me. It was great. It was so great. I gave her a big hug. And oh, my God, we laughed about that for years afterwards that she was able to use the pink balloon while she was in a coma. Um, another one that I really like is called the red bubble. Of course, you can pick any bubble you want. This is really good for somebody who has nightmares. And so, if a, especially children. And so with the red bubble, what you do is so let's just say you have a, a child who is is um uh struggles with nightmares okay so you have them lay lay on their bed and you lay next to them and say all right honey we're gonna make a bubble over your bed and the purpose of the bubble is to make this your safe happy place nothing can get through the bubble unless you want it to come through the bubble so if you want me to give you a hug, you got to let me through your bubble. If you, okay. And so you basically have your child uh, lay on their bed, do a couple of deep breaths. Do it again. And then with your hand, draw. Okay, honey, I'm going to make your bubble. Here it is. Oh, look at this. I'm making a bubble. It's right over your bed. And of course, you have your child close your eyes. They're imagining. Now, can you see your bubble? <gasps> it's shimmering. Isn't it pretty? It's kind of like a rainbow. But it kind of looks like a fairy would make it too. Let's make it really fun. Okay. Now, the cool thing about this bubble is it's your safe place. The only thing that can get through this bubble are things that you want to get through this bubble. Anything else can't get through. It's not going to get through. And so as you sleep tonight, I want you to remember you've got this wonderful bubble over your head. And that also is a really good self-defense tool, especially now in the era of social media. Now, listen, we can't let a total stranger ruin our day. We have to have good defense skills. We have to teach our kids and teach ourselves how to have that bubble online. Listen, no matter what you do, there's going to be somebody who does not like you. You could say, you know, God bless America on the 4th of July, and you'll have somebody not like you saying that for one reason or another. Or you could say, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. 25% of the people you, you meet are not going to like you. And in the era of social media, they don't just not like you from a distance. They'll just, they'll, they'll trounce on you however they can do it on Facebook or Twitter or, what, or Instagram or whatever. We all have to have good defense skills. The only people that you really need to pay attention to are the people in your daily life that you touch and hold. You cannot allow a complete stranger to upset you or to make you feel worthless or ashamed or vulnerable. That's one of the things that I had to learn early on when I started the IC Network. Because guys, before we had 
Facebook and all this, what we had were internet news groups. And then I started the IC network. And with the IC network, we had 200,000 patients a month using our website. And you better believe we got a slam dunk lesson in how to stop fights early on. The power of words are very, very compelling, but it was very hard. I had a lot of people yelling at me back then. I had the guy who sold magnetized uh, mattresses yell at me for not letting him promote his crap on our website. I had somebody yelling at me because I banned him from our website when they said nobody should have children, which was a load of shit. And it was, it was very, very hard to not take their feedback very, very personally. But it's 28 years now, and I got really good defenses, you know. And if a complete stranger emails me a hate letter, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow you to change my work. I'm not going to allow you how to change my purpose in life. I'm not going to allow you to change how I'm relating to the people around. I love constructive feedback. You got something to say to me that you th will make me a better person. I'm off, I'm, I'm, I'm off for it. I love feedback. I love ideas. I love suggestions. I'm the yes girl. If you have a project you would like to pursue in the IC world, call me. I will help you. Because back when I started the IC network, nobody did that for me. Nobody did that for me. If, and, and guys, we got a next generation coming. And so when I'm gone, who's going to be here? We need more people, the more the better, but we have to treat each other with respect and dignity. And we have to have good self-defense skills on the internet today. We just do. So the only people that should, that you should ever allow to uh, give you pause are the people that are in your life every day that touch you and hold you. A complete stranger, they have no power. Remember, they have no power. Yeah, they might have a wicked word. They might be able to send a mean email or a mean post. But if that's about them, that's not about you. You know, think about the bullies in school. They bullied. They weren't bullying you because you deserve to be bullying. They were they were bullying because somebody was bullying them. When somebody's harsh and aggressive in an IC support group, really what that means is that they're in pain. But that does not mean that they have the right to diminish others and that, or they have the right to insult or be aggressive to others, right? Right? And I have to remind myself of that sometimes because, um, you know, the last year has been pretty, pretty draining for all of us. And uh, uh, in the end, we all have our own purpose. And um, nobody should uh, uh, diminish your purpose. If you know in your heart what you are meant to do with this life, do it. Be humble, take feedback, but you, there's no reason for you to take abuse. So as you're working on the internet, you need to have your red bubble too. Right. As you're posting you and 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 remember, too, you know, one of the things that made me like Joel Osteen and I know some people don't care for him, but I, I find that that some of his things are, are quite good. And I really I really find it very, very encouraging. He did a he did a, a great uh, talk about the Internet and social networking. And, and he just said, listen, 25 percent of the people you meet are going to like they're going to like you and they will always like you. Thank you, whoever you are. 25% of the people you meet will hate you. They will always hate you. 25% of the people you meet will like you, but their opinion could be changed for the worst. And 25% of the people you meet will not like you, but their, their uh, opinion could be changed for the better. And, and basically what he's saying, listen, don't exhaust yourself trying to change the opinion of the 25% who just don't like you. They will never like you. It is ridiculous. Do not waste your time there. You have to, uh, what we have to do instead is um, try to help, try to, try to help those who are receptive to it. And I try to let my actions speak louder than anybody else's words. And that's been true for the IC network for 
28 years, 27 years, um, uh, you, you will very, very rarely, I, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned somebody by name and dumped on them. Um, in these meetings, I would never do that. Now, privately, I might have my best friend that I will talk to that I will vent to, and that's fine. But, um, you know, we have to remember to debate the message, not the moral character of those who, uh, we disagree with. And that's the ultimate flaw with life today that we've got to teach our kids is that we have to learn how to separate that. And it's very, very hard. It's a very, very hard. I don't want anybody to be hurt because they're participating in an IC support group and people are picking on each other, right? So don't pick on each other. And don't even come on support groups if you're not feeling well. If you're having a bad day, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling anxious, not the time to be on an internet support group. This is the time where you call your buddies. You Hopefully you've got some IC buddies that you can talk with and get outside. Go take a walk. Take a step back. Now, um, we have some really big, big things happening. Um, so again, I've got the book release, IC 101. It's not just a bladder disease. I think I'll be putting up the PDF of that later this week. It's a yellow and black cover. Pretty excited about it. Um, and then we're going to have the IC 101 medical records kit. We're going to have the IC 101 diet. We're going to have the IC 101 flare management guide. Very exciting. And the thing that you don't know about yet is even bigger than that. And I, it, all I can tell you is that it's just going to change the way that you track your symptoms, manage your symptoms, and work with your doctor. And um, I don't want to give it away too soon. Uh, that's probably going to be available in the fall. And I'm super Oh my God, I've, I've already seen the first version. Oh, wow. It is so much better than I thought it could ever be. So we got that coming down the pipeline. That's pretty cool. We also have IC Awareness Month coming in August. And um, I think for, you know, the challenge that, that so IC Network runs IC Awareness Month, um, and we have for ever since it was done. Um, what has been the thorn in uh, our, my side and our side in running IC Awareness Month is we now have fires. And September is the worst month, and September is IC Awareness Month. Um, the purpose of IC Awareness Month is to give you the tools you need to raise awareness for IC in your community. IC Awareness Month is not about me. It's not about the IC network. It's not about the ICA. It's about mobilizing the real important people in the IC movement, you, and asking you, is our IC patients being treated nicely in your community? Are they respected? Are they given therapies? Are there good doctors? Are there knowledgeable resources? And if there aren't, we have a list of things that you can do to raise that from posters to press releases to things like that. So, um, uh, but we need a slogan for this year. We don't have a slogan yet for this year. <laughs> and I'm a little, um, you know, um, jaded because we're already having fires almost every day and they have told us that it is going to be an apocalyptic year in Northern California. They have also told us for those of us who burned last year that we will burn again this year. I mean, that's really what they're saying is that don't think you're safe because you burned. You're at more at risk now because now the super flammable underbrush is back. So I am um, um, not as optimistic as I would like to be about being able to do much for IC Awareness Month. Um, uh, if anybody has any ideas on what you think we should do uh, from a slogan standpoint, we've done on our the website is icawareness.org. 
Uh, so uh, last year it was your story is important. Your voice matters. Your, you know, because, you know, um, I'm very different as a national leader. And that is, I don't think that my voice is the most important. I think your voice is the more, most important. I can only tell my story. Uh, my story is unique to me. And there are so many other stories out there and needs out there. And the needs of a patient in Louisiana might be very different than a needs from a patient in Washington state. Um, and we've got to get as many stories as out there. We've got to really assess how this community is treating IC patients and pelvic pain patients. Nobody should be told that this is an incurable bladder disease anymore. I mean, that, in my opinion, is malpractice. Um, so we've done, your, your story is important. Your voice matters. We've done, we stand together. Um, we have done, um, uh, let's see, where is it? Here it is. Um, we, we stand together. We are stronger together. Shining a light on IC. We refuse to suffer in silence. Millions suffer. Few understand September is IC Awareness Month. So if you guys could just... Uh, anybody got any other possible slogans we could do? <laughs> Um, and then um, I'm always looking for volunteers who want to step forward and help a little bit. Uh, we have to draft the press release. Uh, we have to launch the poster contest. We need judges for the poster contest. We need judges for the meme contest. Uh, we do the doctor and physical therapist of the year awards, um, which I, I have to those are done for last year. I just haven't had the uh, trophies made or the plaques made. Um, and if there's something else we could do, I, I kind of think that what I'd like to do um, is I want to start doing Meet the IC Expert lectures again, we're bringing in the best, the best lectures in the world, um, which we've done before. We've done over, uh, over 120 live events online featuring the best researchers. And we even had the director of the National Institutes of Health speak to our group. Um, so, um, I would like to try to do that again this year, but I don't know how I can do it live in fire season. So we might have to do it pre-recorded instead so we can film in July and then in August and launch them in September. So anyway, so I see awareness month coming up. Please think about it. If there's anything that you think we should do or we could do better, Go on over to icawareness.org. You can look at last year's materials. We definitely need some need some fresh ideas there because this girl is, is dealing with real life fires now. We had two fires up by our warehouse within two miles last week. And yesterday we had a fire in Windsor that burned two homes. And then we had a fire here. Uh maybe five miles away up over the hill. So it is what it is. All right. Well, listen, last call for questions. Last call for questions. Anybody else got any IC questions I can help you with? Uh, let me pull out this database and anybody want me to give any referrals or you have any questions? All right. Rhonda says, yeah, I missed the lectures. Remember the one in Philly? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I just don't think we're going to be doing live events um uh probably for another year it'd be really great to do a national ic support group a, a big national ic meeting um or at least a regional meetings that were live streamed so people who were far away could participate um but i don't see us with covid doing any live events until we get through next fall and next winter, and we see what variants happen. Uh, I personally don't intend to go. We have our next AUA meeting is in uh, Las Vegas in September, and I could get there. I could get there. The question is, is do I want to get there? 
We're going to have to wait and see what happens this summer. All right, last call for questions. Last call for questions. All right, let me give you my homework. You have homework for 15 minutes a day. I need you to do something for your spirit. Go outside, sit in the sun. Close your eyes, just rest. Nature heals. If if going to church, it may, gives you comfort, do that. If sitting uh, in a recliner with a cat on your lap, reading, reading a book, do that. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your noggin. I need you to read stuff. Listen, you got two fabulous books that are free on Kindle Unlimited, Facing Pelvic Pain and Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, along with our website. For God's sake, read an article a day. I want you to be able to walk into meetings like I can. Nobody can minimize me because I have IC anymore. I know the research. I know that even my brother, even my brother tried to do it this week by sending me a somewhat interesting email. and I emailed him back at one in the morning and said, did you look at this and this and this and this, right? All right. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your pelvic floor or your bladder. Make an IC friendly meal. Make an IC friendly meal or do your pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, Ileana is on Facebook. Hi, Ileana. Nice to see you. Ileana, there's somebody who's got to be in it. She's got to be a guest speaker in whatever we do for IC Awareness Month. Uh, Ileana has been involved longer with IC than I have been, I think, I think, or we got started around the same time. She says, I have friends in England and they're looking at another shutdown this summer. Yikes. Yikes. Um, okay. So for 15 minutes a day, do your stretches, all that sort of stuff. And then for 15 minutes a day, I need you to laugh. I need you to laugh. Come on, guys. Laughter mediates pain. Let's get some joy in that home again. Open the open the drapes. Open the drapes. Let the sun shine in. Watch something funny. Watch some TikTok, which I find personally quite addicting. All right. Sufficient set Grace says, I'm new to IC, not even sure if I have it, but I have persistent UTI, was on two courses of antibiotics per year advice, have eliminated acid food and drink. So did changing, so so Grace did changing your diet change that did your symptoms change when you re when you uh, eliminated ac acidic food and drinks andrea says what's the name of your estrogen cream uh, I, uh, I personally use a compounded preservative free estradiol cream fg says what's the best time to call when you're free in the afternoons uh, in the mornings i'm doing elder care and i'm doing email okay so grace says so remember, Grace is new to IC, not sure she had it, persistent UTI symptoms. She changed her diet and it helped at first, but no longer. So um, Grace, it's, it, well, I think the best thing you could do is let's try to subtype you first. Let's see if we can figure out what the physical reality of your body is. Is it, do we know, I mean, has anybody looked in your bladder? People are asking for our number. It, uh, our, our phone number is right on our Facebook page and right at the top of our website, 800-928-7496. Okay, let me open this database here and uh, we can look up some names for you guys. I just have to open up Excel. Okay, wrong Excel file. All right, okay, here it is. Okay, so, um, okay, uh, pelvic specialist in West San Fernando Valley or Simi Valley, California. So, um, you know, what you, do, what you do have in Southern California that is really quite exciting is you've got Pelvic Health and Rehab. Um, I think that they are an amazing group of physical therapists who specialize in pelvic pain. They have offices in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the L.A. Basin, on the peninsula, in uh, Massachusetts. Um, and so down in the LA basin, you've got Stephanie Prendergast, who is the former president of the International Pelvic Pain Society. 
She is an absolutely phenomenal pelvic floor physical therapist. So in terms of, so hold on a sec. Let me just look here. So in Southern California, in terms of urologists, you've got uh, UCLA Burbank Urology, Caroline Walner, uh, Phil Hanno at Stanford, Mark Litwin at UCLA Westwood Urology, uh, Joshua Gonzalez, uh, but the, uh, the last two focus on men, uh, just, Justin Hellman at Cedar sinai Towers Urology, also on male pelvic pain. Um, Akini Enemuchukwu and Amy Doberfull at Stanford Urology and Jeanette Potts at Vista Urology. Now let's see physical therapists. A uh, physiatrist, if you're looking for a physiatrist in Southern California, Leah Rispoli at Remedy Pain Solutions in Marina Del Rey or Manhattan Beach. And in terms of physical therapists down in Southern California, uh, Ventura Orthopedics in Camarillo. That's Holly Moody, Bonnie Lasher at Tranquil Health and Wellness in Dana Point, California, that's on the coast. Jondra Mueller at the Pelvic Health and Rehab Center in Encinitas. So uh, Destiny Bochinski at Encinitas Outpatient Rehab. Um, Hogue Physical Health in Newport Beach. Uh, Anna Tracy at UC San Diego, La Jolla. Uh, Pelvic Sanity with Nicole Kozian, Ellen Meisner, Elizabeth Nakamuru, and Sharon Thompson in Laguna Hills. Uh, Deconstruct Health in Long Beach. Sartan, Phys Sartan Physical Therapy uh, in Los Alamitos. Pelvic Health and Rehab Center, Stephanie Pendergrast and Courtney Edgecombe in LA, downtown LA. Literally probably one of the best in the world, Stephanie Pendergrast. Uh, start in Physical Therapy in Mission Viejo. Tri-Valley Urology in Mur Murrieta. Amy Block Physical Therapy in Newport Beach. Fundamental PT and Pelvic Wellness in Poe, Debbie Cohen. The Physical Therapy Effect in San Diego, Scripps Clinic, Rancho Bernardo, San Diego, that's Joyce Steele. Cottage Rehabilitation in Santa Barbara, California, Natalie Hicken Hickenbotham, I was born at Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara. Fusion Wellness in Sherman Oaks, California. That's Heather Jeffcoat, Mary Shriver, and Nancy Wong. Custom Physical Therapy in Thousand Oaks, Angela Spruill. Uh, Start in Physical Therapy in Tustin, California. Andrea Gutierrez at the Henry Mayo Fitness Center in Valencia. Elizabeth Macus at Henry Mayo Memorial Hospital in Valencia. Uh, Jillian Giannini uh, in Pelvic Health and Rehab in Westlake Village. I'm not sure where Westlake Village is, to be quite honest. Okay, anybody else, any state, anybody looking for any names? Uh, Mary Jo, uh, you'll, you'll have to Google, Google it or reach out to me. Uh, so Chloe, um, look at Pelvic Sanity. Uh, in Orange County or um, Sartan, Sartan Physical Therapy. So Grace says she eliminated acid last Monday, which was my last day of sulfa. Next day, pain was gone. Was also taking a 
probiotic, which had cranberry in it. Yesterday, I stopped the probiotic because I was concerned about the acid. Should I keep taking the probiotic? Um, so, uh, Grace, what type of infection did you have? Was it cultured out positive as infection, or are you just guessing you had infection? All right, Kay is looking for Dallas, Texas. All right, let's look at Texas here. Hey guys, I don't know these people. I mean, I know some of them personally, like Stephanie, but but this is a database from Harvard. So, all right. A, a pelvic pain providers in the USA. All right. So Dallas, let's see here. Houston, Austin, Austin, Round Rock, Dallas. Okay. It's a pain specialist doctor at UT Southwestern in Dallas named Carl Noe. NOE does peripheral nerve blocks, sympathetic nerve blocks, and ablation. Uh, John John Michaels at Interventional Spine and Pain in Dallas. Uh, there's a, a physiatrist. Again, a physiatrist does pelvic rehab. This is an important, this is an important referral. Um, uh, Rucha Capadia, R-U-C-H-A-K-A-P-A-D-I-A. -A -A -A, at, at the office is called Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. Um, at um, uh, right on North Central Expressway, in, right in, in Dallas. So Rucha Capadia, also Kelly Scott is also a physiatrist. Dr. Scott specializes in the diagnosis, non-surgical management and physical rehabilitation of pelvic floor disorders. Dr. Scott performs an array of diagnostic tests, oversees pelvic floor physical therapy, prescribes medications and may perform therapeutic injections. Member of the International Pelvic Pain Society. So that's Dr. Kelly Scott at University Hospital in the Physical Rehabilitation and Medicine Clinic. It's okay, write that one down. That looks pretty promising to me. I don't know her personally, but there you go. And in terms of physical therapists, let's see, Austin. I'm just looking for Dallas. Uh, UT Southwestern Center, Linnea Craft. So it sounds like your best bet there is honestly uh, Dr. Kelly Scott, because it sounds like they've got physical therapists on staff who do pelvic floor work. Okay. Cindy says, yeah, Ileana says Nicole Cozy and at Pelvic Sanity in Laguna Hills. Exactly. Yeah. And her book, The IC Solution, is really, again, was a groundbreaking book when it came out. Good book. Uh, Cindy says, I was in an auto accident a week ago. I've been flaring ever since. Emotions and trauma really hit me hard. Oh, Cindy, I'm so hard to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, my God. Were you hurt? What happened? Holy moly, girl. So Grace, he back here on YouTube says, there is no evidence of infection in either of the two cultures. The docs gave you antibiotics based upon the symptoms. Okay, so you, you really need, so understand number one, Grace, that the symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, although you absolutely feel like it's coming from your bladder, can actually be, be triggered by something else. It can be, so you've got to, this is now a process of elimination. Um, it can be caused by tight pelvic floor muscles. It can be caused by endometriosis on your bladder, fibroid tumors pushing on your bladder, et cetera, et cetera. So now, now that they've ruled out UTI, we have to start looking at other things. How old are you, Grace? How old are you? And Ileana says, don't forget to do your di diaphragmatic breathing. Use your diaphragm. Using your diaphragm activates your vagus nerve, which is the nerve in your body that triggers your body's relaxation response. 
people should practice this breathing exercise five to 10 minutes a day around three to four times, uh, five to 10 minutes at a time, three to four times a day. Once a person becomes comfortable with diaphragmatic breathing, they may start to practice the exercise while seated and standing. Yeah, I got a bone up on that. I, I mean, I, I know I've, I've been through that before. Okay, so great. So, so seriously, so how long, how long has this been going on, hon? I mean, have you had bladder problems, urethra problems for years, or is this brand new for you, like in the last couple of months? Three weeks. Okay. So at the age of 59, you are now postmenopausal, correct? Are you still having your periods? Really? Wow. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. So even if you're still having periods, you have to understand that you are at least, <laughs> you should see your answers to me. No. Yes. <laughs> okay. At your age. Okay. You're right. You're not having periods anymore. Okay. Is that you are absolutely menopausal, postmenopausal. What that means then is your estrogen levels are consistently and steadily, steadily dropping, right? And that affects your skin and that affects your bladder. That affects all of your mucous membranes. You know, think about the bladder for a moment. The bladder is the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste because urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of stuff. So how does the bladder protect itself from the caustic substances in urine? As a nice thick coating of mucus, we call it the mighty mucus. And the purpose of the mucus is to serve as a barrier. It protects the skin from whatever's in your urine as well as from bacteria. Unfortunately, that mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have a lot of estrogen, you have a lot of mucus and you can get away with stuff. When you're older, you have much less estrogen, much less mucus. And what that means then is that your bladder's ability and your urethra's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That is not a disease. That is aging. We call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And the urethra is the canary in the coal mine. It's often that the urethra that is the first part of the urinary tract to start screaming when you lose estrogen. Your estrogen levels have now dropped to a point that they're physically affecting the urethra. And it can feel like there's a drop of urine stuck in your urethra that won't come out. At least that's how it felt for me. And that happened to me when I was like 52. So, so you're, you know, power to you, girl. You've, you've done really well, but it is what it is. It's going to happen. You're going through it. And your skin is going to change. And that means the skin in your urethra and the skin in your vulva, the skin in your vagina, the skin in your bladder and your mouth, all of your mucous membranes are affected by the loss of estrogen. And so it would be very interesting to have the doctor look at your vulva and see if you're showing signs of estrogen atrophy. It, it presents in a very typical way. It's very obvious for them to see that. And uh, if they do say, yeah, you're getting pretty dry, normally what they do is they give you a prescription of, of a topical estrogen. And um, what they had me do is rub a pea-sized drop, put a pea-sized drop on my finger and rub it right into the entrance of my urethra. And um, it took, uh, I think I did it four times before the symptom went away. And if I forget to do it, it comes back. If I don't use my topical estrogen for about two weeks, I start getting that urethral burning pain again, again and again. So, you know, the most logical thing that could be, happen, could be happening is just simple estrogen atrophy. Yeah. So seeing a gynecologist or a urogynecologist makes total sense here. But you want to go over onto our website, icnetwork.org, and uh, look at the blog, The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. I would want to know, did you change laundry detergent? Ha, 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 uh, are you using a menstrual pad that might have a chemical in that could be irritating, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, definitely a gynecologist. You know, um, 
And they can always do a next generation urine test too, just to see if there's anything else funky going on. But the odds are it's, it's, you know, as my doctor said, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck at your age, we would be really expecting to see in your urethra some sensitivity. Okay. Now, listen, I do want to warn every, everybody out there. One of the things that happens with, you know, they don't tell us this. You know, it's so frustrating that as we get older, we don't get important tips like this. Um, when you start using topical estrogen cream, if, if that's what they give you, the odds are it's going to feel hot. And it might even hurt a lot. It might feel like it's really burning you, but it's not burning you. That heat is a direct reflection of the quality and health of your skin. So what that means then is the hotter it feels when you put it, when you put it on, that means the drier and more compromised your skin is. And as you continue to use it, that skin starts to use that estrogen and it starts to produce mucus. And so you have to grind through the first two weeks. I can't tell you the number of women, they use it once, it burns like hell and they never use it again uh, for, for like years. And then their symptoms, they just get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and drier and drier. And then the next time the doctor says, girl, you are so dry down here. You've got to use the estrogen. And she says, I'm not going to do it, but it burns. You're, you're stuck. You're just going to get, I mean, think about how painful dry mouth is. Dry vulva, dry urethra hurts like hell. And if you catch it early with that little bit of estrogen, you could save yourself years of suffering. But understand that the first time you use it, if you haven't used it in a while and you're super dry, it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, for me, it probably burned, the first time I used it, probably burned for about 30 minutes. Um, and then it just got better. And then within 10 days to two weeks, it was like a little puff of warm air. It's like somebody blew warm air on my vulva that quickly and it was gone. And if I don't use my estrogen cream for two weeks and I use it, it's hot again. Um, and again, that's just a direct reflection of my skin. I have to be consistent. And I'm, I kind of suck at being consistent sometimes. I'm being very consistent. I take my medications at night. Uh, I remember to take them at night before I go to bed rather than in the morning. So I do everything at night. So at night, I take my muscle relaxant. I take a quarter of a flexoril if my neck, if my neck or my pelvic floor is being wacky. I take my thyroid pill. I take my low acid vitamin, bladder smart low acid vitamin, and I take my Peora. And uh, I am pain free. If I forget to take my Peora, I start getting my pin pricks in my skin again after about two weeks. So I am loving, loving the Peora. I also have found that um, if I don't do a yogurt a day, my stomach gets more weird. I get more belchy. I do better if I do, I do a coconut oil yogurt in the, I mean, not oil, coconut milk yogurt in the morning. I don't do dairy. I do coconut milk. So Leslie Ann says, what is your opinion of bladder removal for severe hunter's ulcer? Well, your end stage and your bladder's in bad shape. So Leslie, um, so what the research, what we've had some remarkable changes in our understanding of hunter's lesions in the last five years. And it began in Europe. It, there's the Europeans who made the discovery that, that patients with hunter's lesions often have a virus in their urine. The patients without hunter's lesions do not have. And so if it were me, the first thing I would want to do is I would want to have a viral test to see if you have active polyoma, it's a polyoma BK virus, polyoma GC, JC virus, or Epstein-Barr. Because if you do have active virus, they could treat you with an antiviral. And, and so, you know, the Europeans made this discovery and what was interesting is that the American researchers 
were stunningly quiet about it. I'm like reading this paper going, oh my God, this is fantastic. This is great. Now we have a clue. And over the years, over the last five years, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for some sort of comment from the American Urology Association or the National Institutes of Health. What I didn't know is that they were actually doing their own viral study and they published that data last year and they too found the polyomavirus in, in a small population of IC patients. Polyomavirus is a virus we all have, but it's normally quiet. It gets turned on if you're immune compromised. And, and polyomavirus is associated with hemorrhagic cystitis. And there are many papers on this. We know patients who, have, who are hemorrhaging from their bladder wall, it's often the result of a viral infection. So what do you mean they have and it didn't help? Leslie, what do you mean by that? Are you saying that they tested for viruses and you've already had viral and antiviral? Or have I just completely blown your mind? She is on Facebook right now. So Leslie, what did you mean by they have and it didn't help? Yes, what? Yes, they, they tested for virus and you did not have any virus? You can just type yes, it's okay. So you had an, did, so did they actually identify a virus in your urine? Which one did they find? And guys, you know, we actually also now believe, oh, you had a virus. Look at that. Do you know which one it was? So, um, you know, let's, cut, let's, let's just try to put this in context for a moment. Um, so, and, and FG, yes, I, I, I will. F, FG, just give me a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're still here. So let, let me just deal with Leslie for a moment, and then I'm going to come back to you, okay? Um, Again, when you have the symptoms of your UTI, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, we are all conditioned to assume it's bacteria. We are all conditioned to assume that it's a, a E. coli urinary tract infection. And you have to remember that the only way that the bladder can tell you that there's a problem is with the symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. A bullet wound would feel like infection. A stab wound would feel like infection. Cancer feels like infection. It's the only way the bladder can tell you that there's a problem. But that said, now that we have more data on the types of infections in, uh, out there, we are, are, are the, uh, our eyes are now much wider. You know, I mean, our perspective is much wider. So as an example, the human papillomavirus, HPV, which is such a public health threat right now. And we have the HPV vaccine for children or teens. HP, there are many, many strains of HPV and HPV, some strains of HPP, HPV are, have been proven to be linked to cancer. And I was working with like a 32 year old who had urethral cancer from HPV. And they 
removed her urethra, they removed her bladder, and they gave her a total hysterectomy at the age of 32 for a viral driven cancer. And what was stunning about her call is that it was like six weeks later and they thought she'd be able to go back to work. Like, are you kidding me? No, <laughs> not going to happen. Not going to happen. That is massive surgery. Um, but what was sad about her case is that was pre it was pre preventable. If she had had the HPV vaccine, it could have nipped that in the bud. So you guys, you have to be aware of the viral pathogens. We also now believe that COVID, we have research that has found active COVID infections in kidneys or 14 research studies that have found active, active COVID virus in urine. And it's not hard to guess that for the 25% of IC patients who get COVID who report extreme bladder symptoms, that they might have active COVID in their bladder wall. We think, I've talked with a number of doctors around, and we all believe that that's possible. So in this case, Leslie's had severe ulcers for 10 years. They found virus. The antiviral therapies were not successful, and now her bladder is so small, it's like a child. You have bad scarring. So there comes a point in time when if the bladder has shrunken and it becomes the size of a walnut, um, that that's really the context in which they would really start considering cystectomy. Um, I think clearly getting a second opinion is cr crucially important. And we never want, to, especially for something like cystectomy, because the recovery time for cystectomy really is going to be about a year. Um, uh, we have a cystectomy bladder removal message board over on our website uh, that has years worth of comments from patients who were considering it and had it done. It's really rare done. But the fact that you have, you know, such a small damaged bladder, we I can certainly understand why this would be discuss discussed. And also to Leslie, so the, the thing that I would really want to, I would want to know, because you say you have extreme pain, and believe me, girl, I totally believe you. Hunter's lesions are the most painful presentation of IC, no doubt about it. Um, I guess when we look at your surgical op, Alternatives number one, they could cut the lesion out, but it sounds that's scenario number one. They could actually just physically remove the lesion. Scenario number two is they could do a bladder augmentation. Uh, and number three, they could do a complete removal. And you say you've got two specialists who, who agree in bladder removal. Well, um, I, I, I certainly would support that decision, but I'm not, I'm not important here. It's, it's what you and your family are. It's important that you talk with a, I mean, it would be really nice if you could talk to another patient who's had their bladder removed so that you kind of understand what that's all about. Um, uh, you're going to need a lot of help if they do it. You need, you definitely need help. Um, you're going to need help for several weeks. Uh, and, uh, whether they, I would assume given at this point in time, I mean, they could either create a bag with a, a section of bowel, or they could give you an external bag through a stoma. Um, and, and, and Leslie says she's feeling sad. I understand that you're feeling sad. You know, I, 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 girl. I get it. I, I, I mean, I really, really get it. I want you to look at it as opportunity. It's actually an opportunity uh, uh, because at some point, and, and guys, now listen, for everybody watching this, this does not happen to everybody. She's had lesions for 10 years. She tested positive for virus. The virus has destroyed her bladder at this point in time, decimated her bladder at this point in time. Um.
by removing the organ and by removing the source of the infection, it could completely change your life. It could. Um, I think if you can, let's, you know, I'm sorry, I'm looking over here because I'm looking at what you're writing over on this other computer rather than right here. I don't, I don't mean to but be offending you by not looking at you in the, in the, in your face. Um, she says, I thank you. I know quality of life. I, I, you know, I, I will say that I've worked with some patients who've had their bladders removed and it's been completely life-changing for the better. They're never tied to a bathroom anymore. They're never tied to a bathroom anymore. And they are so grateful to have their bladder removed. Um, this, the sticky wicket in this whole thing is the fact that you've had pain for some time. And it's and so we have to assume that, you know, your muscles are pretty tight because muscles get tight when you're in pain. That's called the guarding reflex. And we also have to assume that you've got some neurosensitization because the nerves in the area have been traumatized. And so it might not be an instant better. It could be. It might not be. It might be that you you're going to have to work extra hard to also calm your nervous system down after you have the surgery done. Um, and um, it's going to require some pain care. It's going to require maybe a neuro uh, anti epileptic medications like Neurontin or again the over the counter Peora. Although I don't think that's going to be strong enough to try to get through this, but it maybe six months later that may, might be viable. Also, you have to talk with your insurance company about what they're going to give you because if you have a stoma, uh, you're going to need supplies. And I had a lady in my support group who. I did have her bladder removed um, years ago and they would only give her like two bags a day. And she was, she was using, she needed like six. And then, so she bought a bunch at cost and then a home care provider threw them away and she was furious. So understand that you're, you, there, there are going to be some supplies and you're going to want to make sure, get a really good clear view from your insurance company, what they will cover for you and what they won't cover for you. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I can understand that you're exhausted. I mean, you, you, you're like where I was when I was waiting to have my surgery for cancer, right? You're just, it's like you're, you know, you know what it feels like is it feels like you've been blindfolded and thrown in the backside of a car and you have no freaking clue who's driving the car or where you're going or what's going to happen. You feel so powerless. You feel so incredibly, it's like numb. It, it's like this, this, um, tragic numbness where you're scared you're, you're just scared and you know you have to do it but you don't want to do it but you're gonna do it and there's an affirmation leslie you know, listen i want you to dive into norman vincent peel the power of positive thinking man if there was ever a time for you to be doing positivity it's right now one of one of my favorite affirmations is um uh, you have never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens to you than you are at this very moment because you are one day older and one day wiser. And what's so cool about that is it reminds us all that, that we've gotten stronger with each flare because we've learned. We have learned. We're not going to make the mistakes that we made when we were first diagnosed. You know, I know better than to do pineapple juice, tomato sauce, and coffee in the same day. That was a terrible flare. I learned from that. You know, yeah. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me every day in every way. My life is getting better and better and better. That which is done for you, let it be done. That which you must do for yourself, do it. That's the one that you're going to really be using. That which is done for you, let it be done. That which you must do for yourself, do it. And that's what happens after surgery is that, is that 
there is a, a learning curve and you're going to be laying in bed and you're not going to want to move and you're going to have to move. And um, and then throwing in the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can get whatever faith you have. You pick whatever faith. Um, you're just repeating to that to yourself over and over and over again. Surround yourself. I can do this. I believe in healing. And, and don't assume the worst, assume the best, you know, um, uh, you know, um, my brother, um, who, um, is not known for saying the right word at the right time. Uh, and it was like the night before my surgery and, uh, I was talking to him and I, I said I, I was scared. And he goes, oh, Jill, just pretend you're already dying. Just pretend you have cancer. And it's like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> I hung up the phone on him. <laughs> yeah, girl, you're a tough bitch in the best possible way. Think about everything you've gone through. You have never been stronger than you are at this moment, girl. I mean, seriously, this is the bitch in the best possible way. Nobody can mess with you. You are tough. I want you to walk in, at, you know, I want you to walk in like, a, you know, visualizing that you're a ninja. Yeah, you like to get up and go and stay positive. Exactly. Do it. Do it. And have faith. Have faith. You know, I mean, um, uh, there are moments when we have to make hard decisions and you are having, you are facing the hardest decision an IC patient can ever face. And that is, what do I do? And should I, should I have my bladder removed? And it sounds like based upon your history and based upon the fact that for 10 years, you've, you've had a viral infection that has just badly, badly scarred your bladder and they can't treat it. It's probably time to let it go. And you have two doctors who have, who have told you that. So if there's anything that I can do to help you, if there's anything that I can do to help you, you know, please reach out to me. Um, I, I hope that if you just do decide to do it, you would let me know your surgery date so that I can send you something. I would love to send you something to, to let you know that you've got this big giant community of icy brothers and sisters. She says, bless you. I will wear a bikini yet. Hey, hey man, I'm telling you, 64 is a new 44. You can wear that bikini. <laughs> you can wear that bikini. And, and you know, guys, that's true for everybody out there. Listen, if any, if any of you are in the hospital or you're going to have a procedure and you're scared or you're going to have a ma major surgery or something, I'm a support group leader. And I've got these really sweet cards that I send out. And if you can tell me when this is going to happen, I would like to do something for you to help you through this because you really are not alone. There is hope. There are people who care. Right? There are people who care. Okay, so I now I need to go back here to um, FG. So hold on, FG. Let me scroll back here. Okay, so FG says, I went to an infectious disease expert for Candida Labrata that showed up on my microgen test. But she doesn't consider it. What? She she would only consider it if it was directly taken from my bladder and ordered a urine culture, but a Norman culture would never show. Candida does not belong in your urine. What? Oh, that's crazy. I do not understand that at all. The Center for Disease Control has, has, has specifically named systemic candida as one of the top 10 drug-resistant pathogens affecting humanity. It's a public health alert. And, and you've, you've the proof that you had candida in your urine and they won't consider it? All right. Well, take the take the data back to your gynecologist. Number one, show it to your gynecologist and say, "All right, what can we do for Candida labrata?" Um, 
You also had pelvic floor Botox injections three weeks ago, but I haven't felt better yet. Should I wait for more? My doc thought that would really work. Well, the pelvic floor Botox is for tight pelvic floor muscles, hon. Um, so apples and oranges, you, you, have, you, you may have a candida labrata infection, which is a beast. I had one for two years. I know personally how bad that can be. Um, but you also apparently also have very tight dysfunctional muscles. So uh, what's the best time to call me when I'm free in the afternoons? In the afternoons, uh, 1-800-928-7496. 1-800-928-7496. I don't normally start returning phone calls until noon, noon Pacific time. Between noon and two Pacific time is a good time to catch me. And if you get my voicemail, do me a favor. When you call, go to extension two or extension three. Those are both my extensions. Leave your message. Um, and if you have a question, Leave the question on the voicemail because there's no nothing more frustrating. Somebody calling saying, I need to talk to somebody, call me. And I call and they're not there. And they call me back. And it's and I say, what's your question? And they call me back and they don't leave their question. And I call them back and they're not there. So if there's a specific question for anybody out there, make sure you leave it on the voicemail so that when I call you back, I can leave you a specific answer if I have one. FG, okay. Rhonda says, a viral infection, what tests will tell? Um, well, there are a variety of tests that can be used to test virus, but generally that we're using the next generation urine test. FG says, can we talk right now? Sure. I tell you what, let's go ahead. All right, you guys, let me shut down this meeting. I think we're done. I could go on for a little bit more, but but your questions have slowed down. And listen, FG needs a little help right now. So I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and stop our support group meeting. To everybody out there, big giant hug from Jill at the IC Network. You are not alone. Carry hope in your heart. This is the new hug. And for people who like BTS, like I love the band BTS. They're the ones who taught me this. Their new song, Butter, is incredible. Go watch the video. They released it two days ago. See, that shows you. Young at heart. Hi, Joan. Yeah, Joan, we're just shutting down. Okay, so FG. Um, uh, uh, um, 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 you got the phone number. Call me right now, okay? 1-800-928-7496. All right, guys. I'll see you later. Be good. Peace to you all.